Hello, I'm Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets, Cabinets HR, we'll launch a crowdfunding campaign on the refund of platforms on June 1st. For more info, go to www.refunder.com slash Cabinets HR. Our guest today is Terry Gilbert. Terry, you ready to be great today? Oh, yes. Terry, what do you do for either for fun or for your hobbies? Oh, wow. That's like, it's that's a low, question. it's, it's a softball, softball question. question. Exactly. Yes. Um, so I, uh, well, I'm a, uh, I'm a science communicator, I guess, right. You know, I, I have a, I do my own consulting uh, and mostly I do that so that I can do stuff that I love to do intellectually and, uh, and then have time for all the other things that I like to do. Um, I love to garden. I have chickens and a lot of animals. I love to cycle. I, uh, I love to camp. I read all, uh, I read a lot. Um, so there's, there's, uh, I figure we can talk about a lot of that stuff. Right. But, um, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm on a, a unique kind of spiritual journey. So I like to do some li literally shamanic journeying. That's another thing that I do in my, my, I don't know, one of the things I love to do. I don't it's a hobby, I guess you could call it, you know, um, uh, but you know, what I do, what I do for my business is, um, I help people talk about complex things. So, so raising chickens and gardening, is that for fun? Do you actually raise it for food or <laughs> I, uh, do you have like one of those yards, like 25 chickens no, and a garden it? No, we've only got five chickens now, but, and that was definitely a pandemic project. You know, it's uh it's amazing how meditative chickens are shocking. You know, it was like, you know, during all of the stress about that, I would go and sit in my backyard and my chickens would roost on me. And there was nothing that could, that could mess with me mentally when that was happening. So, so you live like in the rural area or no, I live in West Seattle. Do you? Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm guessing y'all don't have a homeowner association. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. Right. You know? So yeah, it's just, you know, it, it's kind of suburban, you know, in Seattle, it's a, you know, it's right on a bus line, but you know, it was one of those. You know, we wanted to find a place big enough for for the whole family. I've got three kids, and my mom lives with us. And uh, and so to find something big enough like that, you kind of had to move out of the move out of the city. It's still in the city limits, but you know, yeah. My kids complained because they said it was out of Seattle. So. <laughs> so how many? I mean, just my own life, like how many eggs do chicken lay a day? Is it the like same number every day, or varies? Yeah, it's um. Well, we've got two bantams, and they they're they're good for like two to three a week, except when they're broody. Right. And so, and they're, you know, they're the little chickens and they, they lay cute little eggs. And then we've got three regular sized chickens and they lay one a day okay. and in the, in the, uh, uh, in the long, on the long days. All right. So they, they actually stop laying. I don't, I don't keep a light on so that they lay all, okay. all through the year. Yeah. So it's, so I'm they, guessing, and yeah, I'm guessing I'll eat the eggs, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I have to imagine that there's like a real big difference in taste as far as like a one day egg out of the chicken versus store ball, right? Absolutely. It's huge. You know, uh, my kids, when they go uh, visit, you know, my daughter's job is uh, is to house it. And so she's, when she's hanging out at other people's houses and they still have eggs, she's like, it's just not the same. <laughs> right. So they, <laughs> they steal as many eggs as they can. Yeah. yeah so. so you're going to keep, keep the chickens for a while. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, I love having them around and they get along pretty well with the dog and you know, the yeah. cats, the That's cats are the same size. Yeah. Well, the last dog we had, you know, they def definitely thought of them as food. So we had yeah. to fence them apart. But now the, now the big chickens, they come into the big yard because the grass is greener. So when like, when you <laughs> take an egg from a chicken, do you like try to stop you or anything? Cause you're basically like taking the child from them or is this? They, it's no, they're, you know, some people apparently have really aggressive chickens and, and I don't, right. You know, I, you know, I, pick up my check-ins and one of them doesn't like me to pet them, but I pet the other ones. And, and the little ones, um, the little ones are broody right now. So they, you know, they scream, <laughs> they scream when I take them off the eggs. Right. And it's not really screaming. It's actually cute little cooing noises, yeah. but yeah. So there's one thing you didn't say, and I asked that question, like, what do you, what do you do for fun? You're the first one who didn't say hiking. Everyone else says hiking. That's funny. I, cause I walk every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that even we've got that Duwamish green belt mm -hmm. and, uh, and okay. I've even, even, even take the, taking the dog into areas I shouldn't have gone. And she's a white, uh, Siberian Husky and she came back completely Brown and I came back with mud up to my, my thighs. So I do, I, I okay. of course I like hiking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, we just see out right. I know. Right. It's like, yeah. it's, it's like, that's just like the normal thing, right. You know, you yeah. buy groceries, you go hiking. <laughs> so what does it mean to be a scientist? Um, 
I think basically if you're curious, if you're curious about something and then take a systematic view to try and understand what it is, right? And so there's the, you know, there's the scientific method, you know, develop a hypothesis, do experiments, do that whole thing. But I think um, I, like, I encourage kids to like, just explore their curiosity, you know, like to, to, to keep asking the question why. And, and so I'm not, I have a pedigree, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not married to it. And I don't think people need to have like, you know, I'm, you know, I went to school forever and ever because I never wanted to leave, but, you know, and I watched people, you know, hang out in college because they were supposed to, and they hated it. And I was like that, you don't have to do that. You, know, you could do something without a college degree. Um, you know, and then, and then of course my kids have got, got their own stories. My daughter never went to college. Uh, she's thinking about going back now because she keeps getting told that it would be better for her if she went to college, but you know, she's not really sure what she wants to go for. And then I had two kids in college at the beginning of the pandemic and then no kids in college at the end of, at the end of the pandemic. So, cause that was just, the pandemic was hard. <laughs> so. So as a scientist, what responsibility does scientists have to the general public? Um, I I think that scientists need to know how to communicate because it's, you know, it's not just, it's not just for knowledge sake, although some people, that's why they do it. It's like they're, you know, I've had people who they would perform an experiment and then they would just revel in that they knew something that nobody else in the world knew, like just like that part, which is fine. You know, it's, you know, it's an intellectual pursuit. It's a, you know, one of those things that gives you pleasure. Um, but I think scientists need to be able to talk about what they do and the relevance of what they do. And I, and, and by relevance, I don't mean, is this going to make me money, right? I'm not at all out of that kind of rele relevance, but like being able to explain to people why they're doing what they're doing, right? And, and um, like being able to do the big picture and not a lot of scientists are good at doing that, um, which is one of the reasons why I went into science communication, because I didn't, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't important to me what science I was doing, but I loved being able to talk about science and what, what it, what it provides for people and, and how they can apply it in their own life, things like that. So that's, so I think being able to communicate, right. And then also to, um, there's, there's a whole world about, um, like the the funding structure that we have now and you know and scientists who go into academia and being able to get tenure which is the you know which is the 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 holy grail right you get tenure and you can never be fired although that's not it's not really the case but you know that that um when they start doing like doing whatever they can to forward them forward themselves like forward their power or for forward their empire or forward you know, what people. <laughs> people think of them. Right. Um, I think that when you start um, has what's the best way to say this when you have a lack of integrity. <laughs> no worries. I, I put my phone on. Do yeah, not disturb for that on, one. Yeah, my phone is on do not disturb. Oh yeah, there's if there's people on your list that are emergency. Well, this is a, a bank. A, a bank. bank. Yeah, that's so I don't know how it's making it through. Wow. Scammers are getting good these days, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so off the sub, so I'll come back to what you say first. Yeah. So Paul sent me a message, right? Hey, I'm changing my number, right? Just so you know. Okay, no problem. Three days later. I got a number from her area code. Oh, it must be my daughter with no number. It was like a scammer. It might be a coincidence, like man, like you're you're good, like you <laughs> exactly. know, you're you're good, you're good. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing the the uh, the things that come up on my phone after I've just been talking about it. So, so um, yeah. So there's forwarding forwarding your position is. Um, really not, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess, you know, human scientists are human beings, right? And there's always jerks, human beings, like there's a whole range, right, of experience, right? And so, um, but, but um, uh, doing something like having a lack of integrity and forwarding yourself, 
you know, I don't think that should happen, right? You know, doing doing science to to forward uh, forward your company's product, or um, or even doing science to forward your own idea, right? That was one of the that was one of the things that I got really disillusioned by at one point. You know, one one of the things I got you know disillusioned by was, you know, I I wanted to. I became a scientist because I wanted to find the truth, right? And then I realized you're not finding the truth; you're just finding stuff out. And um, and I was one of the things that got me really upset was that people really don't, really don't care care about evidence, right? That that whole thing. And uh, I was like, well, what's the point of having evidence if people don't care about it? And then the other one was um, uh, that um, when when you're when you found the result to an experiment right you've got the result and then and then people do what people always do is they interpret it right and i and i watched the exact same result get interpreted in two completely different opposing ideas and i was like wow there's no yeah there's no truth. To support their own personal bias yeah yeah and sometimes you don't do it on purpose right you know that's the whole unconscious bias thing but um to just to forward your to forward your ideas and you know that's you know some people are just smart enough to be dangerous with you know yeah i know one criticism of a lot of people are, are scientists are doing pandemic like a lot of them had this like came across so arrogant like i'm the scientist don't question what i'm doing i know better than you yeah. like yeah and first of all like it kills me if people say don't question science right you're, you're supposed to question science right, <laughs> right. isn't that the background of science question yeah the science? yes it's question the science absolutely right and, and um and i i i think there is there there is error, like being intelligent right i mean i know, you know you're smart course, you're, right? you're, hopefully you're smarter than most of us right well, you know like yeah smart, at yeah. least in your discipline anyway yeah but there's so much nuance right like there's so much nuance in in stuff right and you know i was studying a, a particular receptor and i was i was mutating that receptor so that we could understand what that receptor was doing when it was in that confirmation right it was like there's so much nuance in into it in in all of it and um element of of uh if there is nuance right and i think that's that's part of the reason why some scientists aren't dating science because such nuance that you don't want to go into the weeds because then you know people just you know just go to sleep <laughs> right but there's but you want to be able to uh at least communicate it in such a way that um that uh, lay people can understand it, right? And and then you know when things get politicized, like that's that's just BS, right? Because you if you want to if you want to talk about the nuance, right? You know I would I'd have a lot of a lot of moms talk to me about vaccination because you know that's like it's the immune system X, right? You know that was the that was the first class I ever took where I thought I aced it and I got like sixty percent <laughs> on it. I was shocked, right? And then I was you know because I loved learning. I was like, okay, let's go into this more because clearly I thought I understood something when I didn't. Right. And the immune system is like that. So, you know, that's, you know, and so there's, yeah, question the science, but you know, don't, don't have it be an accusation when you, when you like, I think that's where people start getting like when you, when, when you have to defend something, this is, we're not, we don't want to defend anything. We really do want to like ask all of the different questions and, and people would come back with, well, there's these, there's these results that are, you know, there's these things that we're seeing, you know, like with the, with the COVID vaccine, that was, that was fascinating as for, as a scientist to watch all of that happen because, you know, the, the COVID vaccine is the, the most studied vaccine ever, right? We had so many people that were I mean, worldwide, right? Right. Like worldwide, like millions of people were taking the vaccine. You know, nobody gets that kind of a trial. Nobody gets that kind of a trial. Right. And, um, you know, and it's also, when you're when you're doing a vaccine trial, it's it's almost if it's like if it's like a life saving thing, it's almost unethical not to give the vaccine, right? You know, like, you know, like for placebo trials, like we're we're just going to give you protein, right? We're just going to give you the protein as opposed to giving you the vaccine, right? But you know, with the co with COVID, it was awesome. We had plenty of people who didn't want to take the vaccine, so we had lots of controls. It was awesome, right? You know, so science, you know, scientists can also get morbid, right? You know, yeah, I know what scientists like. I think maybe they need to be more transparent, right? Like, I mean, this might be an example, but I remember Dr. Fauci, I think that's how you say his name. Yeah. He he remember he said uh, you know, we're mass. Yeah. But we we the rumor is because they need to, hey, don't wear a mask, you know, if people really need it. 
I think everyone was okay, cool, we got it. Yeah. And when you get some F war, but you just he just put and then I think his credibility well, things just got, was things destroyed got take, after that. Well, things got taken out of context too, right? You know, there was a lot of a lot of things where um it you know it's it's just the half of what was was said, right? You know, or like maybe the whole conversation was was about look, we don't have any we don't have any PPE for the medical. So, and we don't really need it for us. And, you know, it turns out that the cloth mask didn't work that well anyway, but, you yeah. know, it was better than nothing yeah. at the time. Right. So yeah, it was scary. You remember, I, like, I forget about how scary it was when that, when, I don't know when it first started, like they, we seen all the images of Italy, like getting destroyed, you know, like, oh shit, that's coming here. Like what we got to do, you know? Right. I mean, it was scary stuff. And like, I mean, as far as pandemics go, I mean, I think we got off pretty good. Right. I yeah. Mean, that's based on stats, you know. Of course, people die. That's a bad thing. But based on stats, like we're we're nowhere near like the Black Plague, the mid 1500s, and nothing right. like that, you know, or the Spanish flu. Well, there's the whole thing about long COVID too that a lot of people aren't taking into account. And um, you know, the there's a um, uh, you know, we don't we still don't fully understand it. And there's a lot of things. There's a there's a lot of symptoms of long COVID that look like things like fibromyalgia and and um, medical conditions that people were just ignored about, you know, because it's like it's 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 bad. It's bad enough to like be, have a, a huge impact on the quality of life, but it's not. You're not dead, right? And so um, there's there's a, a lot of people that are disabled now. Like the the qual their quality of life is is much lower because of long COVID, right? They can't breathe, they're exhausted, right? You know, it's kind of invisible, invisible illnesses, right? And so, you know, people sometimes wonder, you know, they, it doesn't, it doesn't, in a lot of time, it, in a lot of cases, people don't give them the benefit of the doubt, right? And so, um, and I, and I do think it's going to be a major, major problem in the coming decades. So, so do you think COVID is pretty much like the flu now? Like the flu, you don't get COVID every year. You have to get your COVID shot with the flu shot every year. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's how that's it's endemic, right? It's it's always going to be around. Um, you know, it, it's clearly, you know, th there's even in Seattle, right? There's not a whole lot of people wearing masks. My daughter still wears a mask everywhere she goes, and I wear a mask while I'm traveling. And and um, and part of the, and part of the reason I do that is not because. Uh, it's it's not because traveling is particularly dangerous. It's just that um, every time that I've gotten sick while I was traveling, it was because somebody sneezed on me or coughed on me, right? And then you know when when you're traveling, you're going someplace for a purpose, so you got to be well. And I was like, wow, the masks for traveling, this is awesome. We should have been doing this for years, right? Because that was one of the worst times of of when I would get sick, you know, just with the flu while I was traveling. So always while I'm traveling now, I yeah. wear a mask. One thing talking about policy, the COVID thought was funny, like people might not realize this, but the COVID was actually done under President Trump, right? But then he left off his body, came in, and all the Republicans, I won't say all the Republicans, but most people were like, I don't, I don't, I don't trust this. But your guy did it. <laughs> You're well, I know he, my guy did it, but now President Biden's doing it and we don't trust him. <laughs> right. I, it, you know, like the vaccine hasn't changed while de delivering something, right? Right. I mean, the mental gymnastics people are doing on both sides of the political spectrum, just insane. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? So, um, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the things that I do. So I'm, I'm on the, I'm a board member for, um, a nonprofit called love is my religion. And, um, we all, all we do with this is we hold events, right? We hold, uh, they're called be heard round tables. And what we do is we bring people across the political spectrum, you know, far right, left, you know, Republicans, conservatives, libertarians, you know, whatever you call it, self socialists, we bring them all into a room and um, we have a, a conversation over a hot topic, right? Like abortion or guns or policing or racism, LGBTQ. Um, and then we, we just, the, the whole purpose is not to change people's minds. The purpose is just to train ourselves to be in a conversation with somebody that we disagree with. And, you know, so, you know, we, we had one on, on climate, we just had one on climate change and our um, on, and on labels and our next one's going to be about drugs, you know, but, um, but it really, uh, uh, right. And to, and, you know, cause we, t we tell them this, the whole, the whole point of this event is for you to listen. And so, and cause we found that when people have the experience of being heard, right, they can let go of, you know, that people like hang on so tight to their opinions that they can, 
start to relax, right? And then, you know, and and people are often shocked at the ends of the ends of the calls because because uh, we we went we went online entirely over um, during COVID, like everybody. And it turns out that it really works in a virtual environment to do this kind of conversation. We can have people from all over the world come in, but um, people are usually shocked at, you know, how to, you know, the, the things that they have in common with other people and, and just to see their preconceived notions get destroyed, you know, like on this last call um, on labels, you know, we had, we had, uh, we had somebody who was talking about relationships that they were in and, you know, they were, they, they realized that their, the label that they should have is, a, was a, was it, I think she said a, a solo polyamorist, right? And, you know, cause the polyamory gets you know, all these weird things. And she's like, I'm not in like an, in a relationship. I just don't have sex with a bunch of people. Right. And, um, and uh, one of the people is like, okay, so I, I understand where she is politically, Right. And then later on in the call, she says, I should probably stop calling myself a Republican. And <laughs> that woman, she said, you blew my mind when you said that. Right. So like there's a there's a whole world of just being able to be in conversation with people because people are so nuanced. Right. They have they are multifaceted, you know, and, you know, this last call on labels, when you when you label something, somebody something, it just it just makes them one dimensional. Right. And you can you like. You, somebody, somebody voted for Trump. And you're like, oh, I know all about you, right? <laughs> you know, or, you know, you know, somebody is, you know, polyamory, right? Oh, I know all about you, right? You know. Yeah, I, I'm a believer. Like, if you took anybody, uh, I'm like, supposed to like the ten principles of the Democrat Party, ten principles of Republicans. No one in the United States hits all ten of your side, right? I mean, you might maybe you might hit nine and one, maybe or eighty two, but yeah. man, if you're hitting all ten, like, I don't know. <laughs> so that yeah, that's one of the things. So this that's one of the things that I love to do because that um that feeds my soul, right? And it gives me hope in the world, you know, and, and it teaches me it teaches me something every single time. You know, when I um I'm a tree hugger from when I was very young, right? You know, environmentalist. And uh, you know, I was I was I've always been annoyed at climate deniers, right? And uh we had we had a call on climate change, and that was amazing right? Like the different people that had different ideas and almost everybody had to qualify what they were saying. Cause you know, they've been vilified, you know, when, when talking to people that had different opinions of them. But one of the things that I got really clear of is that um, if there's no hope, right? If, if we're like, this is it, we're done, we're all dead. You know, if there's no hope, it, it, um, it deadens the creative aspect, right? It, it has your creative fibers not firing because there's no hope. Why, why even, why even look for a solution? And, uh, and I think we've been doing that to our kids, right. Yeah, you know, I like, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I'm sorry. We, we fucked up the world for you, but you'll be fine. You know, you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, right. You, you go, so, Elon's going to take you all to Mars. Right. You'll be fine. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was one, that was one of the things that I, I really got from that one. And I've changed how I, I speak about it. Right. You know, we, we have no idea. None of us can predict the future. No. And back to the listening, I'm a firm believer that we, the world would be a better place if people would just listen, understand instead of listen and respond. Right. So many people right. listen and respond. You can see him have looking on the face, like stop talking. <laughs> so I can tell you why my point is better than yours. Exactly. Yep. So, and we address that exactly in the, uh, in our round tables. Cause that's, you know, that's just a human, it's just a human thing. So you do a lot of public speaking. I like to talk. Is there a difference <laughs> when you just talk to public speak, is there a difference in your preparation, how you do it versus a small crowd or large crowd? No. Same, same process, same everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, mostly when I, when I have, when I'm talking to people, if, even if it's, uh, not so much if it's on one-on-one, -on -one, but if it's to a group larger than that. Um, I, I'm always wondering, like, well, what's my intention? Like, why am I doing this? Right? What's what's the what's the point? And then and then have conversations based on what the intention is, like what I'm what I want them to get out of it, what I want to get out of it, things like that. So next, I found this on your LinkedIn on your about. Explain this. Enjoys creating environments both online and live, which people experience being connected to what matters most to them. Yeah. So. Um, that was, you know, I, that was specifically, uh, the, the be heard round tables when I, when I created that, but, um, 
it's it's not only that you know one of the things that we talk about in a round table is a, a sense of psychological safety right and you know being in hr right like a, a sense of psychological safety is is a rare thing um at work right you know there's some places that people are really comfortable and they can they can spout off half-baked ideas because they're not worried about you know like getting getting ahead or what are people going to think about me or things like that so so creating a space of psychological safety is something that um that I did in the we do in the round tables but it's also you know in my in my work you know when you're you know in academia you know it's it's difficult for a a graduate student or a, a newly minted postdoc to be able to like just share their ideas, just spitballing, right? Because they have to look good, right? They have to look good to the postdocs and they have to look good to the professors. And there's this whole hierarchy and in academia where, you know, you know, God forbid that, you know, you would voice an opinion about something that a Nobel laureate or the dean of dean of uh, the dean of your department is an expert in, right? There's like just there's um there's not a, a safety in being able to just spout ideas, just to spitball, right? Um, and so, you know, we do that in the Be Heard roundtables, but um, I was also uh, a part of a, a group that developed a methodology so that you could you could have those kinds of conversations innovatively. Like if you're if you're looking for like, um, you know, in inside of you're looking for new innovative ideas. Right. We we actually developed a methodology so that you could have that kind of a conversation. Right. And you can have that conversation using we we used a, a platform, um, a graph database platform, but allowed the platform to be a, a boundary object. So you could actually take a look at ideas. Right. You could take a look at words. You know, one of my favorite co quotes is George. <laughs> I'm literally going all over the place with this. This is funny. But George Bernard Shaw, you know, he says one of the one of the biggest illusions about communication is that it's actually happened, right? You know, a lot of people will use a word, and um, because they understand what the word means for themselves, they it's they think it's the same, it's the same thing of what other people mean by that word. You know, like, you know, just you know, if just like the word field, right? You know, it's it's it means something entirely different to a, a geologist right to um you know somebody who's working on electromagnetism like right? electromagnetic fields or you know somebody who plays baseball you know there's outfield right like like that word is so loaded because it means so many different things to other people but we never check in and say okay when you say field what exactly do you mean by that but we've created a space where we can do that kind of thing like okay when you say innovation what does that mean for you right and so people will you know, we'll talk about and 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 we've created a way for them to talk about those those kinds of those kinds of words inside of their own context. So then that, then it's like, oh, okay, so I have a context for this, and I think about this in a particular way, and somebody else can say, oh, I it, I don't think about it like that in that way at all. I think about it like this, and and getting that getting that little bit of um, uh, interaction, right? And you know, and it like it breaks down the levels of like, you know, I you know, most PhDs, you know, I, I actually had to deal with it, deal with this myself, but most PhDs are really worried about looking stupid, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like to prove that I'm not stupid, right? That's how I, why I got my PhD, right? And I was, yeah. I was so close to the end of my PhD. And I was like, well, I don't need to prove that anymore. Do I need, do I need my PhD? And my husband was like, yes, you need your PhD. <laughs> I've been supporting you for years. So you do need your PhD. So, so when you do these boards, like how you, like, how do you make sure it's not dominated by extroverts talking to you? How, how do you make sure, like, you know, you you entice the introverts to actually say their piece? Well, so, so for example, in the, like, in the, uh, the we call this the f facilitated conversations, right? And I, I I developed it with the the founder of Exaptive, which is the last startup that I worked for and and uh, an organization in the EU called Climate Kick. Um, but, uh, you know, you actually... Put, we put up words, right? I talk about a boundary object, right? It's a it's a visualization of how people are connected. Like they would they would have connected themselves to a particular word, like you know, knowledge management, right? You know, and because it's a it's an abstraction that is it's high enough up that it's going to be imperfect, right? But but people can then talk about it, right? And um, and so you have that word up, 
and people have, will have connected themselves to it. So if you click on that word, and so for example, one of the words that I usually associate with myself is improvisation, and I'll describe what improvisation means to me, right? And then, uh, then the next person will be connected to that. So I'll just, you know, you can actually call on that person regardless of who they are. So we don't know who they are. We just know that there's a person connected to that. And we'll say, so is that what, is that what you meant by that? And I've actually done this with somebody and, and his response was like, no, I didn't mean that at all. I got to change what, what words I was like, no, no, no. It's just, that's, that really is how this works. You know, your, your meaning of the word improvisation is different than mine. So what do you mean when you said that? Right. You know, cause for me, the reason I love improvisation is because it's a, you know, one of the rules in improvisation is you always say yes. Right. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what somebody says, you just say yes. Right. And then have the conversation that way, because when you say no, it just blocks, right. There's like, you can't go there anymore. That's not usually what other people mean by the word improvisation. So they get to share what that means for them. And then, and then you call on other people, right? And so sometimes the people you call on is going to be the CEO of an organization. And sometimes who you call on is the intern or a graduate student, right? Or, or an undergrad, God forbid, right? You know, that they would be involved in the conversation, right? But then it allows people to, you know, everybody who's in the room to have a say, right? And then it's, um, and things about it is, you know, we did this at a conference. Um, I think it was in Copenhagen last year. And, uh, you know, there was about 50 people in the room and we just, you know, we walked through different terms like that. And then about 15 minutes later, we stopped everybody and we said, okay, so do you have a sense of who's in the room? And, uh, and everybody looked around and they're like, well, yeah. Right. You know, cause like one of the, one of the biggest problems that people have at scientific conferences and, you know, somebody actually had it during the meeting that we were having is that, you know, you take, you take 30, 45 minutes introducing it to everybody and, you know, and nobody's listening, right? Nobody really cares what they're going on. But, but when you do it this way, people talk about what's important to them and, you know, and why they said improvisation or ecosystems or, you know, whatever the word is that we have connected to them. And, um, you know, cause they're, they've got their own context that gets laid out. And so, most people had a sense of, well, I know, I know what that face looks like. I know their name and I know what they're, what they care about, right? They don't, they don't necessarily know their title, right? Or their pedigree or where they work or any of that, right? But they know the important thing about them to be able to have the kind of conversation that sparks innovative ideas. So. Yeah. It's amazing. That, like you're a group of people, you like judge people and whatever you're like, oh, this person can't make a contribution and kind of off the subject, but like, like, have you ever had those hot Cheetos? Yes. <laughs> so you probably know this, but a janitor actually made that. Really? Yeah. This no, I didn't know yeah, that. This janitor would work for the Frito Lay company. Every day he would buy regular Cheetos and put hot sauce on it <laughs> and shake it up. And then that's how hot Cheetos came, right? That's and awesome. I, and I could imagine some random janitor, mm -hmm. I'm sure it made him like millions and millions of dollars. But Maybe. Right? Yeah. I just hope he got some of the cut though. Exactly, right? Yeah. You know, I have a, I actually know the guy who invented USB. Oh, but, wow. you know, but he worked for a, a big, big yeah. software company. So, he yeah, didn't, I just didn't... remember those sticky notes, post notes. Yeah. The person made that I got no money because he worked for the M, I think it's called the M Corporation. Yeah. So like, so they got out of Monica's intellectual property. Right. Right. And so, yeah. So I, I do hope that people, and that's one of the things that, um, you know, the, the, all, oh, I, we can start talk, talking about, you know, the, the way the, the way it's set up you know, people expect that ideas should be free, right? Like, I don't need to pay you for your idea, except like, that's the, sometimes that's a hard thing to come up with. So yeah. how do you, how do you give um, people credit yeah. for I their mean, ideas? A bonus or something, right? Like, or something, or, yeah. Or, or a cut of the, about, mm -hmm. um, so Netflix has a movie about when Michael Jordan signed with Nike long back in the day. Yeah. And he wanted to go with Adidas. And so the money matched. And so Michael Jordan's mother said, we'll sign with you if you give us, Percenters of the of, of the shoes he sells across the world. First, I, I said no way, like it isn't done like that. And then said, "Best ideas." And, and Bill Nice, okay, screw it, let's go all in and give them no money of each shoe, which had never been done before. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's got to be done. Some you know you gotta you gotta way, yeah. you gotta break the rules a little bit to like to have it be equitable, right? Exactly. You know? Yeah. So back to labels, right? So first, I think it's bad. Like if someone like someone labels me as Three different things, right? Yeah, that's bad. 
but isn't it just a bad if I label myself a certain way? Well, it depends, right? You know, I, um, when I, when I was introducing myself during this, the labels, the, the labels conversation, I said, I'm a tree hugger. And I, I was a socialist from a small child when I lived in the socialist country up North and then moved down to this socialist country. Right. And I did it on purpose, right. Cause I wanted people to like, to start to deal. You know, I, I tell people, look, you might get triggered, but you know, this is a safe place for you to get triggered. And yeah. then you can just come back to the conversation. And there was a, there was a retired cop on the call. And he's just like, I was so triggered when you said tree hugger and socialist, <laughs> I didn't know what to do with myself. Right. He says, but I could really see that, you know, cause, because once you start to get to know people, you're like, well, that you're awesome though. Why yeah. would I, why would I hate you just because you call yourself that? Right. Or, you know, and you know, and you, and you, sometimes you label yourself something and it's good. And sometimes you label yourself and it's limiting, right. You know, that, you know, uh, non-binary, right. Like that's a label, right. You know, um, you know, my best friend, her, uh, she was given the name Karen. And then when it became derogatory, she was <laughs> like, well, I never liked it anyway. So why, you know, you know, why would I keep it if every time I hear it now it's turned into, you know, this, this horrible thing that means yeah. like a middle-aged white lady who's entitled and, you know, that I want to speak to the manager. Right, exactly. And, she says, and, she goes, and I am, yeah, I'm a middle-aged white lady. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's already, it's already bad enough. So yeah. she changed her name, right. Even though, even though she thought she was going to be labeled a hippie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I know like labels, like, you know, I think, I think they take a stream, like, you know, most people say tree hugger, right. First off, most people had like someone like at a tree stopping, thousands of jobs were coming right or <laughs> something like that, you know, or like to extreme, right. But it's not really like that. I wouldn't think. Right. You know, but the thing is, you know, so labels will, they can, they can make it easier. Right. You know, but then they can also like, they, they can box you in. Right. So, you know, there's the, you know, our, our, our hope with that particular round table was that people would, wouldn't stop at the label. Right. Like, you know, just there's, you know, we've, you know, we had a, we had a round table early on um, uh, about Trump, right? And so that, you know, that there were people on the call who, you know, voted for Trump and who love, love him and thought he was great. And, and, and you know, there was a space of, you know, we're, we're not out to change anybody's mind or convince anybody. We're just, you know, having people be in a conversation, even when they don't agree with what's being talked about. So that one was, that was really hard for a lot of people, right? You know, just to like, to be with somebody like, really, you, you love them? Right. You know, like what? Yeah. I don't right? know why I love, love any of them. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. But you can, you know, you can, you can kind of get a sense of um, the, the, the labels will, will have you, you know, we had one guy on the, the, um, the vaccination call and people are like, well, if that guy is going to be on the call, I'm not going to be on the call. Yeah. Right. I just, I'm, I refuse. Right. And actually it, the people who are on our calls, it's, um, it's pretty wild, you know, like, like we've got a lot of people who we love and adore who just won't be on the calls because they can't, they, they will not be in a conversation with the other side. Yeah. They just won't. They're like, I'm not giving them a platform. I'm not giving them a voice. That one thing right. that killed me, right? Like when people say, don't give the platform. Cause um, I'm wrote a couple months ago when Connor arrested all the anti Jewish stuff and this guy named Lex Fridman had on his podcast, Lex Fridman, he was like me and downloads the podcast. And he had the blast of Lex Friedman of giving Kanye a, a, like a platform. But Lex Friedman was like, well, I want to have a conversation with this guy and see what's going on, right? Right. So always tell me, say, don't give someone a platform. Right. How are you going to know the ideas and all that kind of stuff? Or, or, or and disprove their ideas. Right. Or even, yeah, that's that's the other thing. Like, you know, if you're if you're not willing to be exposed to, to ideas, like there was a, you know, one of the, somebody on one of the calls said that, you know, financially Trump, you know, Trump did great. And I was like, like I, I heard the words and then I thought, well, I should go look at that because I know my filter bubble definitely doesn't say that. Right. You know, so there's, you know, there's, there's a whole world of, if you're willing to listen, at least you can then even go explore it. Right. You don't have to change your mind on things. Yeah. That guy who was on that, that vaccination call, he, um he got heard, right. Like people, he shared his point of view and everybody listened and he'd never had that experience before being heard. Right. And then somebody and then uh, and then somebody else on that call said, well, there's a voice that hasn't that hasn't been heard yet that and it's not necessarily my voice, but I think somebody needs to speak for this point of view. And she just talked about how vaccination protects the community. 
right? Like the whole, and, and, uh, and it was, you know, people heard, heard immunity a lot, the whole thing, right? During that, but because, because this gentleman had been heard on the call, he'd never actually really heard that argument in a way that made any impact. And he was like, wow, I got to stop being such a dick on Facebook, right? Like he, and he actually did, you know, tone down his rhetoric because it really, you know, his experience of being heard, right? You know, one of the things that we say is that, that you know, our, our, uh, our mission is to create a world where when, you know, people, you know, when they're, when they're heard, they actually have the experience of being, you know, there, there's more love in the world, right? You know, their hearts are, are opened a little more. So, yeah, it'll kill me. Like people say, we're both anyone but Trump, we're both anyone but Biden. My mm-hmm. thing is like, okay, both go for, but like, it's not like it's Trump or Superman, you right? Know? <laughs> you know, the choice is a Biden or like, right. <laughs> or, you know, a reincarnation of JFK, right? Yeah, if I had if I had my druthers, I'd rather not vote for an old white guy. Yeah, you know, actually, I, that's that's my wish. Number one, can we have somebody besides Trevor Biden, and can we have somebody at least sixty years old younger, right? I mean, I don't think that's a high bar. To it's get, not you know? a high bar. It really but, but so isn't. far, our country hasn't has that doing it. Yeah, well, it's you know, it's a yeah, it's an interesting it's it's an interesting time right now, right? Like you know, it's not a typical conservative liberal thing no. now. You know, now we now we're like, okay, are we? Is this are we really, is this going to be about democracy or authoritarianism? Yeah. Like, are we going to go, are we going to go full on fascist? Right. Yeah. And you look at president Biden, you're like, man, this guy's been in office since the 1920s or something like that. You know, For, he yeah. looks like the, you remember that show tales of the crypt. Yes. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me right now? Like, but then it's like, I, I don't know. It's but then like, the, op- then the other option, right. You know, yeah. I, yeah. you know, I grew up in, I, I grew up in, I was born in the United States life there and you know while i was growing up you know in your you know your year to, your obnoxious years right so like from when i was 2 to 19 i was i was an obnoxious american right you know i'm like i'm american i'm american i'm american you know i you know there there was even a civics class in canada where they they had this um this idea like what if the the united states is in in ottawa how would you feel and i'm like eh. I don't care. Right. And he's like, what? Right. And, you know, and then, you know, and I was like, like watching this guy get all riled up because I was an obnoxious teenager. Right. And, um, and then one of my friends is like, she's American. Right. And he goes, Oh, right. You know? And so I was like uh, an obnoxious American the whole time growing up. And then, um, and then I went, came back down here to go to college. Right. And I was, uh, I was confronted by how Canadian I was. I, oh my God, I'm Canadian. <laughs> right. You know, I was, I was in, in my, in English class in, um, and I, some guy in the English class was talking about, um, like the horrors of Canadian television, like all the swearing and sex on TV. And I'm like, all, are, all are TV, you, all TV is like that stuff America. Right. I was like, like are TV you kidding Germany, me? Italy, France, all across the world, right. there's cussing nudity on TV. I know, only, right? It's only in the United States. Right. And so I was like, are you kidding me? Have you seen how violent it is on television here? And everybody looked at me like I was weird. And, and the guy, and they, they just kind of brushed off what I said. Right. And I, I understand why that was now looking back, but in that moment, I was like, are you freaking kidding me? I said, would you, would you rather have your kids growing up having sex and swearing or being violent? And uh, the teacher's like, Terry, calm down. And I'm like, are you, you know, and then, um, but, but um, a couple of year, uh, a couple months later, I was talking to my dad, maybe it was a year later. I was talking to my dad who still lives in Canada. And uh, it was right after the uh, the massacre in in Montreal at a McDonald's, right? And I said, "How are you doing?" And he's like, "It's we're pretty shook up." And I was like, "Why? Like that happens all the time." He goes, "Not here, it doesn't." And I and I realized like when I first when I first got down to the states, I was like, uh, "It was the the like the amount of violence here, right, is scary, right?" But but you'd get desensitized to it. And so after a while I was desensitized to it. So that, that was, that was what would have me say to my dad, what it happens everywhere. Right. But it was also what would have me say, do you see how much violence is on TV here? And people not understand what I'm talking about because you just, you know, you have to, yeah, you have to withdraw from that a bit. And so once I realized how, uh, how desensitized I'd become to that, I was like, I was kind of shocked. And then 
then I got my Canadian citizenship. So, <laughs> so I'm a dual citizen now. <laughs> cool. And it's crazy, like how many people have labels on them and they don't match the labels. Like, this is my opinion, right? So President Bill Clinton, he ran as a liberal Democrat. But if you look at his record, he was actually a conservative Republican. Because right? he got rid of welfare, he bounced a budget. You know, of course, some of that's because the conservatives ran Congress. So he's like a good politician, yeah, you know? You know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't buy it that the Republicans balance the budget. I just don't buy it. Like, yeah. look what happened. Look yeah. what happened with Trump. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah, sure. This whole debt ceiling thing right now, like let's let's cancel all of Trump's Trump's uh, tax credits. Yeah. If we cancel all those, that would go a long way to balancing yeah. the budget. So. And then like the second president Bush, he's a conservative Republican, but I would argue he was a liberal Democrat because like he spent so much money, like he did the war, gave tax, you know, gave so much money away. President Obama, if you look at his record, he actually was a moderate Republican, not a Democrat, right? Yeah. I was in, um, uh, in, I was, was it, yeah, it was, it was in Copenhagen a few years back. And this was, this was before Trump was elected. And, uh, and she's like, what's the deal with, you know, like um, Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump. And I was like, I know, right. She goes, she was there exactly the same. And then I realized that she was so far left, right. Yeah. So far left that looking at those two, they looked, they looked the same. And um, you know, there's that, there's, you know, when you, when you actually look at just how skewed we are, like we are so skewed to the right in yeah. this country, even the, even the, the, the left leaning that, you know, like this, you know, that I'm, I don't care if I call, you know, I call myself a socialist mostly just to annoy people, I think. Right. Because it's not a bad word. Right. You know, we have social security, right. Yeah. You know, of course there's people who want to cancel that, but you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Just, I, I watched this thing where AOC, I don't, the other thing is you like talking about, you know, like most people think Democrats are left. She said, no, most Democrats are, are conservative, right? Yeah. Like Joe Manchin from West Virginia, the one she said, oh, yeah. Us from the left, we're like, you know, it's, we're not Democrats. So I thought yeah. it was an interesting point. You know, when I first, when I first got here, you know, I, I uh, went down to the courthouse because I'd never been able to vote before because I was a, an American citizen while I was in Canada. Um, so I went down, got myself registered and, uh, and I didn't know anything about politics here. I didn't know anything about politics in Canada because I ignored both, right, while I was growing up. Um, but uh, so it's this tiny little town in the middle of New Mexico, and we're in the courtroom. And and my my friend was uh, was registering across the like across the the hall. It was it was a big room, right? And uh, and I she says, "Would you like to register yourself as a Democrat or a Republican?" And um, and I turned around and I said, "Hey, Tanya." Is 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 Ronald Reagan a Republican, Republican or a Democrat? And she goes, he's a Republican. <laughs> and so I turned around. And I said, register me as a Democrat, right? <laughs> so, which offended Tanya to no end. But you know, so yeah, New Mexico is pretty conservative too. So well, sometimes some yeah. some places, you know, yeah. I, my uh, the last company I worked for was in Oklahoma City, right? Which is like a blueberry inside of a <laughs> red bowl of soup, you know? Yeah, so. just like Austin and Texas, the same yeah. way. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. Just the, I love the maps that show that don't show land, right? Because land can't vote, right? And so when, when you, when it shows the people, right? And you can see all the, the swaths of, of uh, land that have no people in them, right? So. Yeah. Another thing I think people get wrong too, like Democrats, they're like, no matter what, Trump could do no good. Like there's nothing good to do. Or right. vice versa, you Republican. Biden can do no good. But actually, you know, every president has done like good stuff for the country and yeah. bad stuff, of course, right? But, yeah. you know, if you're the different, you know, like for example, Trump, he did a thing where most people don't know where, like, suppose someone's like rich and they sold like stocks or something, right? They would get taxed. Well, Trump had a law where if they invest that money into like the hub zones, like poorly economic neighborhoods, they'd have to pay tax for like four or five years, right? Right. Which is like really did good for a lot of your city business, right? Yeah. But no one really knew about it because yeah. he publicized, right? And, and everyone does something good or bad, right? Oh, yeah. Can't in the bad. That's right. You know, the, and, and, you know, everything is, you know, when, you know, and every, everything's about sound bites, right? So, you know, people cherry pick data and they oh, cherry pick sound bites yeah. and they like, like 10, 10 second clip. Right. You know, they, you know, they, uh, they, the, uh, the, I guess the left took the statement from DeSantis's lawyers about what does woke mean? Right. And it's somebody, you know, somebody who is like, I can't remember what it was, but they, but um, the, the thing that he added to the end of it was that they, they take advantage and they think that they don't have to follow laws because, you know, whatever. Right. But they just took the front part of the statement to make it, make them look, make them look bad. Right. That's what, you know, people are, people are doing that. Right. So I find, I can't, I can't watch news much. You know, I don't, I don't watch 
I don't watch news. Right. And I, and I don't spend a whole lot. Of, I like, I, about once a day I'll, I'll check the, check the news feeds, but I, I do it like on the AP and BBC yeah. and Al Jazeera just to get like some. Yeah. I think Al Jazeera is a really good news source. Yeah. I like them. Yeah. Versus some old stuff over here. I remember those like President Biden, which summer, summer event. And one, one news or source like basically said, President Biden is saving the world. Other <laughs> and other ones basically said, President Biden is sending us all to hell. Exactly, <laughs> right? Same picture, same, same everything. That's that whole thing about science that I was telling you, yeah. the exact same thing. And then people just spin it the way they want to spin it. And so it's, you know, um, you know, I, I moved up here because I really like being in my liberal bubble. I do, you know, even though my in-laws say that we live on the left coast. You know, I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Yeah. So back to around around us, like my point of view, like I think everyone needs to be around around us to some extent, right? Like for me, like I want clean air, clean water, you know, that kind of stuff. Do we really, really need like um, oil coming from Alaska and Prudhoe Bay? Maybe we do, maybe we don't, you know, because like I, I I grew up in Odessa, Texas. There's so much oil in the Permian Basin, right? right. Like they've been calculating hundreds of years worth and they discover new oil fields all, all the time. Like why do we need this different oil? But on the other hand, like, and I talk generally, like if you're around around us, do you really want to get rid of everything? Right. Like, do you want to go back to the 1820s mm -hmm. where you like wash them, you know, using outhouses, no electricity? Right. Well, there's this, there's the whole thing of nuclear as mm -hmm. well, right? I mean, you know, it's, that's it's the clean. Safest, that's the safest. And it's clean. It's really clean. Yeah. It should go down, it should well, go it's, down. it's safe until something goes wrong, yeah. right? You know, but that's the same thing with uh, with pipelines, right? Yep. You know, and so. Yeah. But see, people don't realize like, when nu like, there's a Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, I'm sure a couple are missing, you know, but like, it's once in a generation, right? Pretty much once a blue moon. Mm -hmm. But it's bad, it's bad, right? Oral, like oral pipes leak all the time. Yeah. You know, Exxon Valdez, you know, it, it happens. Blue Horizon. Yeah. yeah you, know. you know, yeah. All yeah. that stuff. It, it happens a lot, right? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So it's, <laughs> you know, um, I was in, um, I was in Vancouver uh, to go see Paul Stamets. And, uh, you know, so, so now we'll meander into psychedelics. So um, it was a, the, the conversation was called how psilocybin can save the world. And, um, and he had uh, an elder from the Haida tribe with him, Guja. And, uh, and that was, it was so impactful having him there. Right. And it was, it was actually really great because first of all, it was like in the scientific conference, scientific light conference, and there was 2,500 people in there and Guja sang a song for him right? You know, just, just blessing him. And uh, Paul Stamet said it was one of the most impactful things that's ever happened to him. And he's gotten a lot of awards, right? Because, um, because he's spent his whole life just trying to get people back to nature. Right. And um, you know, that one of the things he talked about psilocybin is it's, it's highly correlated with people being um, to nature relatedness, like having people get connected, get connected to nature. So, and this, you know, this goes back to the other thing about where people are connected to the things that they love, you know, my, my purpose in life is that people experience being profoundly connected. Right. And so that, you know, connected to what it's always right. You know, the, you know, it's also, I, it's also why I like graph databases, right. It's all, it's all about connections. Um, but, you know, connected to people or, or connected to the planet or, you know, connected to, to, you know, what it is that they're doing, like really being engaged and, and um and loving their life it's the whole thing about being great when you said that right i was like you know of course you know that's that's why i would be here right because people can become connected to what it is that they that they really like um and uh and when you, so that that whole that conversation with paul stamets was pretty was pretty remarkable particularly because guja was there and that's one of the things he said is like people just aren't connected to nature anymore yeah they're just not yeah. And talking about psychedelics, like, first of all, like, I have no idea how, like, marijuana and psychedelics are like a class one drug, right? Oh, I do. <laughs> right. I mean, I know, I know in America, it was back to Richard Nixon and yeah. all that stuff and yeah. all that kind of stuff, you know, which makes no sense. But when well, it does make, a, make sense from a, a, a particular point of view. Like, we are losing, we are losing the job force. So, you know, like, there's the, like, there, people, you know, tune in and drop out, right? That's what they're talking about. Yeah, why not, right? Yeah. And um, and so it's so it's a uh, um, you know, it it was psychedelics were a uh, were a disruption, right? They were a they were a disruption because it was, and it was like it threw a wrench into a lot of things. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. 
Ooh, that's nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was the, that, that whole thing, right. You know, I, I grew up after that, mm -hmm. right. My parents, you know, when I talk, my, my, my dad's got six siblings and they were all hippies. Right. And they, you know, they all got tired of LSD. Yeah. Right. You know, and the, you know, my dad used to joke around about one of his buddies showed up with a big old bag of MDMA. Uh -huh. Right. And he's like, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> right? And hand it off to my dad. Yeah. And yeah. my dad said by the time he, he couldn't do it anymore and hand it off to one of his buddies, right. There was still hundreds of pills in that little yeah. bag, which just cracks me up. Right. But you know, so that like, there's a, there's a different attitude yeah. to, you know, and I, and I grew up in the <coughs> just say no. Yeah. I grew up like LSD. You take, if you even touch it, you're going to go mentally you're, insane. Exactly. And right. Your, your mind's going to blow apart and you're going to be put in a mental hospital and then, you know, all right. these evil demons are going to come take you over. Exactly. Right. Right. And um, nothing like that at all. Right. Well, you know, the caveat, like there are some people that, yeah. that, so I, um, I love Stanislav Grof's work. So he did a lot of, um, exper like he was doing a lot of experiments, um, on psychedelics. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when prohibition happened, he'd, he'd done enough work to know that that's not the only way to altered consciousness. Yeah. Right. So he, he started doing breath work, right. You know, you know, because experience is just by breathing, right? Yeah. Or wrong, I guess. However, however, it's, guess it's your point of view, right? Yeah. But um, so you know, they, there's a whole world of, you know, altered consciousness, right? Altered states of consciousness, which I find fascinating, right? You know, as a neuroscientist, I'm all about fucking with the mind. Yeah. Right. So I, you know, I love that that whole world, and and, you know, uh, you know, as a scientist, there's a lot of a, you know, a lot of where I concentrated, you know, I got fascinated with G protein coupled receptors. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they're like the most amazing machine ever. Right. But you know, it's a, it's just a receptor on the out, on the surface of cells that binds to a molecule and then starts this whole signaling cascade. And just the idea that, you know, this is how you talk from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell just captured my imagination. And I, I right. I got like, I got, I got deep into that. Right. Right. And then receptors are, they're the, they're the receptors that bind to things like cannabinoids, you know, cannabis, yeah. uh, opioids, um, tobacco, the nicotinic receptors, you know, serotonin, right? Like all of those really cool receptors in the brain, not all of them, but most of them are G protein coupled receptors. Nice. Right. And so, you know, I, I remember the first time I, st I started a, a postdoc at the, at, at UW here, when we moved to Seattle and, uh, and after, right. You know, and then, uh, the, my, my advisor walks into the lab and he says, okay, who needs cocaine? And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I work in an opioid lab. Right. You know, it's like, there's like, you know, like there was this whole world of like, wow, I forgot that that's like, there's all these other impl implications yeah. to, to the opiates. Right. And so, you know, that was one of the receptors that I worked on was an opiate receptor. Yeah. And I know a lot, a lot of people are getting more open, like psychedelics, like most people don't know this, but like, of course, Texas, like really conservative, right. People don't know this, but like, I might be making something like that's four or five years. The state of Texas Republic or uh, House or what it is, they've been like five million dollars a year for research for psychedelics to help veterans on PTSD, right? Exactly, right. Yeah. So there's a there's a whole world of, you know, so um, not many antidepressants work, right? And you know, when when my um when my daughter went on antidepressants, right, uh, the, the her doctor just just ask her how they how they work right she'll she'll be able to tell you how they work right and so when she asked me i was like we don't know how they work right you know it's you know the so just to give you kind of an example when you close your eyes right you know everything goes dark right immediately that's a g protein coupled receptor right it's like it happens like this right and there's some that take minutes and all that but there is no g protein coupled receptor that takes weeks to work so that's some other process going on right like that's like gene expression, like you're actually changing your mind, right. For the, for the drugs to work. We're not exactly sure how it is. We know some that has something to do with the serotonin receptor and all that. But so when we, I was what, what completely um, captured my heart and soul and mind 
was um, psychedelic therapy that actually works, right? You know, they're, that, you know, they're, one of the things you could say about a lot of mental disorders is a, that they have in common is that you've got, it's a rigid way of thinking about something, about yourself, mostly about yourself. And if you could let go, right, if you could let go of how you think, if you're, you know, if you could let go of the grip of it, right? You know, so if you, you know, if you watch Michael Pollan's um, documentary, you know, there's, there's people who um, OCD, like was just, you know, crippling them in life, right? And then, and then they were freed up from that, right? And people who um, ha- are, uh, have depression or anxiety, and that's, and that relaxes, right? Like there's, when you see some of the effects of that, right? It's like, yes, we need to study this stuff. Absolutely. We need to study this stuff. And then when you start to look at the different, the, the different things that we can do, like MDMA to treat PTSD, it makes total sense, right? You know, ecstasy is, you know, you're, you're, you're experiencing love, but then you're also dissociating a little bit. So, so you don't, you know, a lot of how we get over the, over things, right. You know, just expose yourself to spiders more and more. And it does, it's not so bad. Right. When we first moved into our house and had the giant house spiders that were like terrifying, but now it's like, it doesn't, doesn't scare me too much, except when they're crawling on me. Right? <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, but, but if you, if you just remembering those things, right. That give you PTSD, just send you into another episode, like being able to dis- dissociate yourself from a little bit, from it a little bit to be able to mess with the memory is good. Right. And so it's like, it's amazing. We should definitely be studying this stuff. Right. You know, and, um, and this stuff is work, this stuff works, you know, they, there's studies back in the fifties where um, 65% of the people that were, that were in a, in a, a drug trial treating addiction, alcohol addiction with LSD, right. Um, they, they never went back. They never went back to alcohol. Yeah. Right. That's like, that's a remarkable number. Right. You know, and so we should, yeah, we should be studying this stuff. It's yeah. So if there's anything else, like I could talk about this for a while, cause there's like so much about the psychedelic Renaissance. Yeah, that's right now. But another person was like pro psychedelic. Now you never think it was. So uh, a guy named Rick Perry was the former governor of Texas. He's he's pro. Yeah. Yeah. He's like and he's like more conservative than Greg Abbott is. Right? Oh yeah. He's like, I mean, he basically wants everyone to be like real pro conservative, and he's like pro psychedelics. I like that blew my mind. Like he's well, psychedelics. It, it but it makes sense though. You know, um, if if you are, if you really so I, one of the things I've heard. Right. You know, that, you know, there is that then often, oftentimes they, you know, they are decent human beings. They have like these personas that are just obnoxious and ridiculous. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Uh, yeah. You know, I can't imagine that, that Bobert and, and Green aren't obnoxious human beings. Right. But apparently some of them just put on a show because yeah. that's, that's what appeals to their base. Yeah. Right. Um, but if you are for veterans, right. And because, you there's study every avenue there's, can to help. there's not a lot that works yeah. right so if you're gonna like if you're gonna you know and it, it, you can only take it so far with meditation and yoga which yeah. do which do work better than some of the drugs right but you know let's let's go there right and so of course if you're gonna if you are really for veterans then you would be pro psychedelic yeah you would be right i mean i know so many veterans like before the VA used to pump people to opioids and antidepressants but I know so many veterans now who do psychedelics. Like I, like I like to say on the podcast, like I know I can't say every veteran does it, but pretty much ninety five percent of the veterans I know have done psychedelics or mushrooms or yeah. edibles or something, right? And they're all like all of them say the best thing that ever happened to them. Right? You know, um, my uh, my stepmom died a year ago, and she had esophageal cancer. So it, it you know in the esophagus, right, which is like cartilage. It's really hard to you know, you kind of need your esophagus, so you can't really take any of it out. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, she lived in Canada. And she's like, thank God, right? You know, because, you know, that she most of her pain treatment, she didn't want she didn't want to do opiates, right? Until the very end, she she used marijuana, right? She used cannabis, because that's like, that's, you know, great. And, you know, you can get as, as fucked up as you want yeah. on it, right? You can have mostly CBD, right? And then get mildly, yeah. mildly high, right? So it's, you know, it's a, it's, it, it's, I think it's, it's just, I don't know, morally wrong to yeah. like hold on to your political view from back in the sixties without, you know, 
and the, the you know the the um the legislation that says you're not allowed to study something yeah i mean i don't know like i think what's called, it's called maps i know maps they've done a lot of studying and nonprofit. you know yeah. like think of all the stuff we haven't learned you know yeah Oh, there's, you know, I, so I, back in 2006, you know, I saw one of this, these studies because they started coming back with, and part of it, a lot of it had to do with MAPS, right? MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, right? And they're, one of the, their things was, you know, if you can just have people have a conversation about something, it gets back in, in you know, it'll get, come back around, right? You know, and thank God, you know, the conversation is more about, you know, let's, let's use MDMA to treat PTSD for veterans or for anybody with PTSD yeah. for that matter. Right. And yet, let's use psilocybin to, um, to treat depression in cancer pa patients. Right. But you've got to study all of the things yeah. about it. Right. Um, you know, you, you really should study, we should study gun violence, right? Like that should be one of those things that we have numbers on. Yeah. And, you know, the NRA has been really good at blocking. If, if you, because they know, right? Knowledge is power. The more you know, the 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 more the more access you have to to something. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Psychedelics is, is funny, right? I mean, all the research could have been done the way to help people. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> What's your point on this, right? So, I can't remember the name, but you have another guy who's in charge of the maps. Dublin, Rick Dublin. So he was on Joe Rogan's podcast about a month ago, right? Oh yeah. And oh, then, I got to watch that one. And they were talking about so Joe's name is Joe Robin. He was. Uh, yeah, he's talking about taking them from nonprofit to to, a, to an investment company where people invest in the company, right? And Joe was like, "No, you shouldn't do this because they're gonna be beholden to investors and it's gonna change your method, you know." But he was like, "Man, like we're not getting enough money from donations, right? It's a nonprofit. If we do what we gotta do, we need the big money." So, yeah. what's your take on that? Should they like go take on investment money or keep on being a nonprofit? Which would be the best way to, for them to do? Well, so there's now there's Maps and there's Maps PBC, which is Public Benefit Corporation. So it's a for-profit entity that is the one that's running their clinical trials, and um, and so uh, and and it it's necessary, I think, really to separate the two, absolutely, because um, I you know that's one of the things that we're we are thinking about for uh, Love Is My Religion also is is to do a for-profit arm where we do um, be heard uh, events for corporations as part of their DE DEI training, right? You know. Um, cause they're, cause they, they aren't making enough money to have this thing go right to, to, you know, they're, they're, they're well known. They're, they're well, there's a lot of other companies that are doing research and all that, but these, these, this guy, our maps has been in the forefront. Um, and so I, I do agree that there's, especially in this society, right. Capitalistic society, right. Like they do that. There is something to be said for having um the market say whether or not this is going to work because that's how that's how we judge things right you know that's how that's how we determine whether or not something is going to work it's not it's not a hundred percent right you know or, or maybe it is right that's i guess is the definition of capitalism right but if they can if they can uh make it work in a for-profit in a for-profit environment then then it really then you know there's a better chance of it having it work and the fact that they did um, a public benefit corp for that, a PBC, um, says that they, you know, it's they they actually have to demonstrate that there is some benefit to yeah. the public, right? So you know, there's that's the whole thing with like with B corps, right? You know, also is like how how do you determine whether or not the company that you're that you want to work with is is good, right? Yeah. Is is gonna is is not just in it for the money, right? So. Yeah, so um, state of Minnesota is about to become the 23rd state to legalize marijuana. Woohoo! What do you think comes first? All 50 states legalizing it or it gets legalized at the federal level? Huh. I think we should, I think it should take take notes from our friends up north, right? <laughs> and just legalize it the whole thing, right? You know, yeah. you know, um, you know, Washington State is having a hard time, right? You know, being able to sell all of the weed it's it's growing yeah right like there's there's elements of yeah states rights whatever right you know, <laughs> right? You, know you know there there's a reason that we're a union of states because it it really works to be able to yeah i can 
I, I can go back on that statement too, as well. Cause then, then you've got like abortion and yeah. you know, like that whole thing, but um, <laughs> you know, there's, there, there's a benefit to being able to, so I think, I think we should, I don't know, I can't predict which one is going to happen, but I really think it should be legalized federally. Yeah. Right. I, I, I think, you know, that, and that, and in Canada, the interesting thing is, you know, so they legalized marijuana. So all of the laws that had to do with uh, psychedelics were kind of in limbo. So you go yeah. up, we go up North, you can, you can go and hit the uh, medicinal uh, mushroom dispensaries. Right. So <laughs> I, I could be wrong, but uh, didn't British Columbia, that's where Vancouver's in British Columbia, yeah. right? Didn't they just like recently like legalize like all drugs? They decriminalized. Decriminalized. That's what yeah. It is. So, so it's, it's a difference. Yeah, yeah. It, it is different. You know, it's, it, it just means that, you know, they're, they're not going to, they're going to go after the more heinous crimes, right? Yeah. Which is, I think is wise. Yeah. Right. You know, there's, there's the, the, you know, they did, they did, um, was it, I think it was Timothy Leary got because, because psychedelics were still legal. He got, he, um, it was a marijuana charge that, that they, they were him. able to arrest him for. Oh, wow. Right. You know, so yeah. like, I don't know, like, like marijuana, LSD. Yeah. But like, I don't, I don't know about legalizing like fentanyl and heroin, you know, that I don't know. Well, okay. you see, you see, you see what does the people in the streets here, especially in Seattle. Right. So, um, there's, uh, and I know these studies are done in rats, right. But this is a better, it's a better model than like a computer simulation. Right. Um, uh, and it's better than doing it in people. Yeah. Right. That might you be know, an ethical dilemma. It's exactly. Right. There's like, there's so many things that are interesting. Like we don't know if there's DMT in the human brain, there's a pretty good chance that there is because we have receptors for it. And, you know, but you know, DMT is metabolized so fast, you know, you gotta like, uh, make the body produce it and then sacrifice the animal really quickly. Right. It's hard to do that in a human, yeah. right. The, all the ethics involved. Right. Um, uh, but, uh, so why was I saying that? Oh, so for a lot of the drug studies, right. They, they, you know, one of the things that they showed is that, that, that rats rodents, you know, will press a lever until they kill themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but they, but what they were, what they were looking at is just to, to put it in lay terms, you know, uh, rats that are bored out of their freaking minds, right? They've got nothing but this white cage by themselves, maybe with a couple other people, right? But if they put them in an environment where they're stimulated, right? Like there's stuff to do, there's like cool, you know, toys to play with, they won't go for the drugs, right? And if you, and th this is one of the things that I, I think about uh, science all the time is like, well, how does that, how does that apply to human beings, right? When, you know, when you, when you alter somebody's environment, so, so they're not, they're not confronted with, I would rather escape into this drug, drug induced haze than to deal with the reality of my life. Right. People will, people will stop doing those things, right. They'll, they'll stop taking drugs. So, but that also means that what we got to do is like, you know, this is, this is where my socialist bent comes in is like, you know, take care of people then right? Like if people are taken care of, they don't, they don't want to do that, right? Like they actually, it's like the, the biological urge goes away when there's, when there's something else in their life. Right. And so, you know, I would love to do that experiment. I think that experiment, but that would be costly, you know, just like crazy ass things. Like what if, you know, what if you just gave everybody a thousand dollars a month? Right. You know, Talking about UBI, yeah, universal, yeah. universal basic income. Yeah. What if, you know, like, what, what if, you know, if you took care of, of some of the basic needs, like I don't have to worry about a house and I don't have to worry about a food, about food. Right. You know, and then, you know, the, the, I think a lot of, a lot of the other issues would go away. It, it, it goes back to the, um, when we, when we were studying psychedelics, there, there was a, um, uh, they used to call it uh, psychomimetics, right? Which means that they it it uh, induced psychoses, right? Like that's what they thought was happening, right? You know, the 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 theory behind those studies, um, the alcohol studies, was that um, LSD would induce the DTS, right? It would induce a kind of psychosis that would make the people, you know, that like I don't I don't want to go there, right? Like sometimes DCs, you know, you hit rock bottom, and there's the only place to go is up, right? So they thought that that's what they were doing 
by um, giving them LSD while they were, you know, addicted to alcohol. Um, and it turns out that that's not what was happening, right? It wasn't, it wasn't mimicking psychoses, right? People were just having a different experience, a, a, a more expansive experience, you could say, right? And so they, they, they like that, excuse me, that was a theory that got thrown out because it was okay to study it, right? You know, that's, that's what you do in science, right? You have a theory, you test it and you're like, wow, that's not, that's actually doesn't appear what's happening with people. So what is happening with people, right? You know, is it the mystical experience, all of that stuff, right? And so, um, so I think, you know, to be able to study that, right? You know, there's, but there's, it's, it's like we, we've, you know, trapped ourselves like this whole political, uh, polarization and how everything's been politicized, right? It keeps us from being able to, um, to be able to keeps us from being able to ask the right kinds of questions or be able to, without it being like, or you're scared to ask the question because you don't know all your friends going to blast you and like destroy you. Exactly. Or, or I'm not going to get funding anymore. Right. You know, like the, you know, every once in a while, the, you know, Republicans will, will, um, bring out like some of the different studies that people are doing, like, can you believe that they're studying sex and ants? Yeah. Right. Like without knowing the context for why we're doing that, you know, you know, why, you know, if we're, it kind of makes sense, you know, pheromones and yeah. pheromones and ants are way more powerful than humans. But is it but, a fence on, on, on the level you like, we're studying why, you know, you know, I don't know why go fish or make good pitch, right? Or something crazy like that. On, on you know, on the, just the level, you're like, okay, why are you doing that? But you go, you gotta dig deeper, right? You really do have to dig deeper because well, most people don't have the time or don't want to dig deeper. Or they don't want to, right? Like that's the thing, right? You know, and you know, and uh, every time people talk talk about how, you know, people should they people shouldn't be getting money to do those kinds of stupid studies. I'm like, you know, you know, you could fund the NIH with one, with one of the bombers that yeah. you're you're totally willing to pay for right yeah. you know so uh, let's not uh, don't tell me about stupid science right you know there's no such thing as just you should be asking all the questions about all the things all the time so yeah and you actually go into like some kind of map psychedelics conference mm -hmm. in june right mm -hmm. where was that going to be at in denver in denver yeah that makes sense yeah <laughs> I mean, I would never expect to be like in, I don't know, <laughs> Nebraska or something. Right, like exactly. That. Then for me, that makes sense. Yeah. So is that yeah. something that annual conference and what do you expect to get know, out of this? I don't know if it's, you know, everything is like, every you know, since COVID, yeah. right? You know, uh, and I, so I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the first one. Yeah. It's the first one I'm going to, right? And, um, you know, I. I bet they're going to have some good LSD there. Well, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. There's a. Uh, so there's, there's different events. Like, you know, I was, okay. I was, I was booking my flights just the other day. Right. So I was looking at, okay, what, what co talks do I want to go to? What workshops do I want to go to? So, um, you know, do I, do I stay for the after party kind of thing? <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Um, and most, most things they'll have disclaimers, like, you know, there's no, we don't, there will be no, <laughs> so there, there'll be no selling of illegal substances yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I saw one that said, we do not condemn or condone the sale. Oh, I, like of I, I know like, it's like, I like oh, that. So, I like that. So, so you find the right guy. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, it'd be interesting expert to me. I think if you had like two people, like equally smart, or, or a subject, have them debate, but one is on that. One is like, yeah, you, I think that'd be, a good you know what though? Me. So um, there's, so when you're, when you're on psychedelics, right? Like there are things that are so profound, right? Like, like, uh, uh, the, like people experience being connected. Right. And it is like, <coughs> it is like, uh, soul searing. It is mind blowing. Like, oh, oh, this is what, this is what it means to be connected or to have love or to yeah. love right? Right. And then you write that down and then, you know, when you come down off the, the psychedelics and you're like, well, that's stupid. Love. Yeah, no, How, yeah. Of, of course, everybody knows that, you know, the most important thing in the world is love, but yeah. like, but you actually experience yeah. it like, like heart rendingly experience it. Right. Being, you know, I, the, the last psychedelic journey that I took, um, was, it was at a retreat and I was like, I was so connected to, to mother earth. It was like, it was incredible. I was like, I was blown away by how much she loves us. Yeah. Right. And then, you you know, I've always been a tree hugger. Right. And so, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, of course. I, I'm like, <laughs> no, you have no you don't understand how 
intimate and connected it was, right? You know, yeah, you never know what's gonna happen, right? Like, oh, one time I was on it, and for like 30 minutes, I was like trying to figure out. So I was listening to classic music, Beethoven. I was trying to figure out why is Beethoven's name pronounced Beethoven? <laughs> why not be Beho- <laughs> like, Beethoven? Yeah, like yeah. 30 minutes, like I couldn't get off that right. <laughs> I love that. I love it. The way the mind mess gets messed up. Right. Yeah. But there, and the, you know, that's, um, it's so, uh, you know, one of the, I, I, I did a, a psychedelic retreat and the two people who were leading it were, were, uh, shamanic pr- practitioners. And I was so moved by how, um, uh, just by h- how spiritual they were. I was like, what is this thing? Right. Cause you know, I, you know, long, long, long time ago, I had a colleague, um, do a shamanic journey with me. And she says, you know, this journey is going to be to take you to meet your, meet your power animal. Right. And so, and I was like, you know, I was getting my PhD at the time and I was like, you know, in the, I was in the, during the journey. And, um, all of a sudden I was in this snowy waste and talking to a Raven, right. It was while it was profound of course then then i come back into it and and uh and you know your mind says things like yeah that's just bullshit though right <laughs> that didn't really happen so i'd had that experience but um after that after that uh that retreat you know i i actually took a class uh on on you know just a, a shamanic calling right and it was um you know and so it was interesting because when you do a sh- Shamanic journey, a shamanic journey. No, is that like the Hawasaka thing? Uh, how, it, how? What's that with the thing that Aaron Rodgers did? It's no, a, that's ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, yeah, yeah. That's that's also psychedelics, okay. right? So I haven't done that yet, but yeah. that is on I, my bucket I, yeah, list. I know two people have done it. One here and one down in Mexico. They both yeah. like said it's like yeah, like the bees knees, as they say. Yeah, exactly. Like if you get an opportunity, take it, right? But and I can't say the word to save my life, right? Ayahuasca, it, it, ayahuasca. Yeah, I can't yeah. say it. If someone said. Say the word correctly, you're gonna die. Well, give me the gun so I can just kill myself. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not gonna say yeah. that. Um, yeah, the uh, so so uh, on a shamanic journey, it's it's sound driven. So remember, I, I said there's other ways to altered states, right? You know, breathing, and so this is sound driven with a like a drum. Um, and so you know, you do drum beats, and it actually does things to your brain waves. I, I think it it takes it into the gamma. Um, but then you know, so you 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 have an intention. Right. And then, you know, do you meditate at all? I try once in a blue moon, but not, not, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I, I found a great way to meditate. Right. And so, but, uh, so there's a, there's a, and, and somebody, somebody shared, um, uh, on a shamanic journey that there's the, there's the yin, uh, yes, aspect to it and a yang aspect to it. And the yang is like the, where you're actually doing the, doing the, the actual, like you, you have an intention, right? You know, you're going to the lower world, right? So you find a hole in the ground and you travel down and then you imagine yourself in a place, right? And then, and then there's the yinna aspect, which is then you just still everything and let whatever comes, right? Whatever comes and, you know, uh, you know, people say, well, it's, it's just happening in your mind, which is fine, right? You know, it's just happening in your mind or, you know, um, and so you let whatever the message is to come through. And usually you come for a, you come with an intention, right? Um, and so, so, uh, so there, there is with shamanic journeying, one of the, the things about it, it's cool is you get to direct how it goes. And I've had some trippy shamanic journeys, right? You know, like I, there was, there was a, there was a, there was a, a journey, it's called a dismemberment journey where you know, the fact that I'm a scientist actually really helped, right? They said, they said, you know, that the intention was to discover what's in the way of you and and your own divine presence, right? And so, you know, all this stuff came up, like there was relationships that were income in my life. And, and and as soon as I let that go, go, it's like getting porous, right? Holes, holes in me. And then all this stuff about Christianity came up and all these Christian, you know, and and all that, that went away. And, And then there was, then there was a point where there was just nothing, right? There was literally just nothing. And, uh, and then, then just before the drumming stopped, it was like all these rocks clicked back together. It was this, it was this road to take me back. And, um, like the, like I, I actually experienced myself be complete. Right. And it was, and it was, a, it was trippy. It was awesome. Right. You know? And so, but with a, with a psychedelic journey, 
you're not, you know, the mushroom is taking you or, or whatever the, or the molecule, the medicine, the medicine is taking you on a journey for you to see. It's going to show you what it's going to show you. Yeah. Right. And you just have to be open to your right. That's the, that's and, the and, whole thing. Yeah. And you have to like, you can't look away. You gotta, you know, take it as far as you can. Well, you know, the, the first psychedelic journey I did, I was, um, you know, I, I've discovered start, you know, on this particular path, just to how in control I like to be like, I like, you know, <laughs> um, and you know, it, when I was, a, I had, I'd had the experience. I had one experience once of letting go. Well, actually turned into three. Um, I was, while I was pregnant, right. I was like, it, while I was in labor, I had the experience of clawing my way to the top of the cracks the, of my contractions, trying to stay in control. And, um, and then, you know, I'd had somebody tell me, don't resist labor, whatever you do, don't resist labor. Cause it'll just, it'll just, you know, the delivery itself, it'll just take forever. Right. And she was in labor for 36 hours. So I trusted her. Right. So here I am clawing my way to the top of my contractions. And then I sat myself down. Right. And I said, look, Terry, you're not getting on off this train, right? There's only one way and it requires you getting this baby out of you. So you should just surrender. Right. And so, um, the next contraction that started to come on, I thought I was going to die, but I just, I didn't, I didn't resist it at all. I just, and it's like, I sank under black oily water and I really did feel like I was going to die. And then it was over. And it was like, I, like I came out of the black oily water and that it's like the sun was shining, like rising. It was like this incredible moment, you know, and I actually knew myself in that moment, just like powerful, right? Like I could, I could, I could withstand that. I didn't, you know, it was fucking awful, but it didn't last forever. Yeah. Right. And so I was like, okay, so I know I can, I can let go of it. And I, and I was in labor for four hours with my first child, right. Because I let go like that. Right. My midwife said that you are not, you know, whatever you did, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta talk to people about that. That was <laughs> awesome. Right. Um, but, um, so that my first psychedelic journey, I was like, I just got to surrender. Right. I, I've done that before. I know how to do that. Right. And, uh, um, and, and I, stayed in control the entire time. There was actually a, there was a, there was a point where I could see all these little bubbles. They were going into specific scenes and I got close to one and there was like people in a living room and I could almost hear the conversation. And the thought I had was like, this is not what I am here for. Yeah. Let's go. Right. And so then when I started to come down, I was so disappointed, right. You know, a, a lot of people who are, who are disappointed by their, their journeys is because they won't let go. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny. Like I, I really do feel like I learned something. So my, my family was just in town and we went to the, uh, the flight museum. Right. And I, and I did a, I was with my son and we did the, um, uh, the flight simulator. Right. And so he was, he was flying. Right. So I was out of control. Right. And, uh, and I was just trying to, trying to fight, just try to try to kill the thing, but the, these flight simulators go all the way upside down. Right. And there's a, there's a panic button. So you can, you can stop the trip if you, if you don't, if you don't like it. Right. But there was a point where I was like, just relax, yeah. right. Just relax into it. And it yeah. was so great because you, you're strapped in well. So yeah. even like my yeah. hair's going straight up, it was, it was a blast. And my son almost pushed the panic button. Yeah. Right. And I was like, no, no, you got to relax into and, it. And that's good, good advice for going on roller coasters too. Exactly. Right. You know, just enjoy the ride. Well, it's for, for really anything, right. You know, um, you know, just to, just to allow yourself right? Just allow yourself to relax and yeah. relax into it, right? Let go of control. Here's some stories on my part. So like, whenever I take it, it's like, it's like, you can, I, I can really tell how unnatural cars are, right? Like if I go to the backyard of nature, if I go to the front yard, the cars go by, oh, yeah. I could tell like, like <laughs> way down the road, that this machine of waste and oil and combustion is coming down the road. You just, yeah. you sense the unnaturalness, right? Do you, is it psilocybin you? LSD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. LSD. Yeah. yeah. So and another time, right? So at my house, in the front part, always have spiders all over the place. Like spider ribs. My wife always knocks them down, right? <laughs> and so one time I was on it, I swear, this spider said, Mr. Jason, can you please tell your wife to start destroying my home? <laughs> like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Did you pass on the message? No. no. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, no. And another time I was out, I was out there in the front yard. And they're not people call them chemtrails, not really chemtrails, you know. Oh, yeah. So it was like one from one cloud to one cloud. I'm staring at it, and it's like starts going to become a laser beam. And so I take my fingers and zoom in on it. And so I zoom in onto the like the the atoms of the this laser beam, right? Yeah. So just stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome, right? Um, and but I think you have that's like 
once you once you relax into yeah. it, right? Yeah, you have to relax. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely have to relax. And that's the things you see how your mind opens up. You know, yeah, it, it's really amazing, right? Well, so you know, one of the one of the things as a as a neuroscientist, right? You know, and I, I think that's also partly why I like Stanislav's uh, work, um, because they're you know, I'm, I'm a student of consciousness as well. So um, Anil Seth has a great book, right? And he talks about how consciousness is just a controlled hallucination, right? It's like, it's, it, it is a, your brain puts together a picture of what the world looks like. And then your senses actually are correcting. Yeah. Like they're, they're looking for the errors in it. Right. And, and uh, it's, it's real simple. Uh, like it's, it, it, it's real subtle, actually his, his uh, theory of consciousness, um, and, uh, when, after I, I read that book, right, I was, I'd act, I, and it'd be, it'd be fascinating how I could see the world change, right? You know, my, we were walking the dog and Scott says, watch out for the dog, right? And I couldn't see a dog anywhere, but then he pointed to it and all of a sudden this dog appeared, mm -hmm. right? And so, and it's, you, you could say, well, you just didn't notice it beforehand, yeah. right? But what if? What if, you know, that, that your mind then created that? Because yeah. then if that's the case, then, you know, the, the, the world we see is based on our assumptions and our predictions and all that. So it makes sense then that there's a lot of things that we can't see, you know, that they, people talk about how um, the, the indigenous people didn't see the ships as they came in, because they'd never seen anything like yeah. that before. Yeah. So, um, and you, and you know, that we know that that's how the brain works. Like it's, it's all associative, right? Like, you know, for example, I was in Vegas a couple of weeks ago for a friend's wedding and me and my friend went to the mall, right? Or not the mall, but the strip, right? Shopping, like whatever. I used the bathroom <clears throat> and the sign said bathroom this way, right? So I went the way, went to the end of the road, into the little thing. There's no bathroom here. Right? I just know bathroom, right? Went back. My friend walked me back. I said, do the bathroom right here. It was right there in front of me. <laughs> like, and I, I couldn't see it. And until you couldn't you, see until it. Until he Point it out. So what if, and you know, uh, people have had this thought before, like what if um, schizophrenics just have less control over what it is that, you know, you know, what if they, you know, what if they are um, seeing something in a, at a different re reality, right? Yeah. You know, like they're, so what, what if there is a veil, yeah. right? And that you could- What if the multiverse does exist? But there are subtler realms exist mm -hmm. as well, right? You know, so there's, there's the whole world of, you know, what are you allowing yourself to see? Yeah. Right. And so there's, and Stanislav Graf talks about spirit emergency. So especially people who are, who are um, heavy meditation or spiritual practices, which are designed to open up those, those kinds of areas of the brain, whatever, call it, whatever you call it. Um, you know, maybe they're not psychotic, right? Maybe they are, you know, they can just see something, right. And, you know, um, uh, and this, this became important, you know, when we were looking at the, when we were in our, in our, um, shamanic class, my husband and I did it together. Um, you know, they talked about spirits, right. And you, you have to keep letting go of stuff. Like, you know, my mind is like, you know, my scientific mind is like, yeah, <laughs> right. But then it's like, um, you know, it, like it does, it does damage, especially for, for people. So, um, Scott said something about spirits, right. And I thought, I thought uh, Sydney was asleep. My child, Sydney, I thought she, I thought uh, they're asleep. And um, I said, Sydney says she saw spirits. She's non-binary and I'm practicing so hard to, to get the right pronoun. <laughs> they, they, um, they were asleep. And uh, then they said, yeah, no, the spirit here is fine. It's, it's friendly. And, um, and then they told me that when, when they were very little, they saw uh, a little orange cat following me around all the time. And my first cat was named Pocket, was this little tiny orange cat. And, uh, and uh, he, he died and we lost him and all that. But that all that happened before Sydney was born. And, uh, and, but, but they saw a little cat following me everywhere. And uh, they were confused confused by the fact that nobody else saw this as well so that was one of okay. right and um you know so that you know there's 
it, it being uh, rigid in your thinking can actually get in the way of uh, other people's, you know, well-being. Like, what if that? If what if that was just okay? What if it was okay to be with a, a little kid? You know, and adults do so much damage to kids' intuition yeah. anyway. You know, they don't do that. That's a, a realistic. You know, just making that up. You know, the and it happens all the time, right? So, like, so like you know how all these kids like marry their friends. Like, how many of these marry their friends are actually, are actually real, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, they, that, uh, so there's, there's aspect of, you know, and, and we do this, uh, you know, kids, you know, you'll, you'll get a phone call and it's, you know, really bad news. And, and your kids would be like, well, what's going on? Are you, are you okay? And, and you say something like, no, no, I'm fine. Yeah. And then they start to question their intuition. Right. And that's not even intuition. They're just like, they're accurate. And then we're yeah. just freaking lying to them. Right. Well, then how many times you hear people say, you know, I dreamt about my brother. He came to visit me in my dream and he died, died the next day. No, yeah. or something like that. That happens like too many times. Well, you know, one of, one of the, uh, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is, is around near death experiences. Right. And, you know, uh, and what I'm doing is scientifically pulling out artifacts, right. You know, ontological statements from people's near death experience narratives to, and, and I'm using machine learning and AI algorithms to, to pull out these um, ontological statements because a lot of them are similar, right? You know, like if you think about uh, Jungian psychology, right? And the archetypes, right? Like they're, they, they, talk, they, they talk about there being another reality, right? Another dimension, maybe we're not seeing, right? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm gonna believe like there's all different type of awards, right? Mm -hmm. There's a world of ants, world of spiders, world of, you know, Dreams, world of like philosophy, all these different worlds, right? That yeah. You don't pay attention to. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we, we don't. Uh, do you do you like to read? I used to. I don't read, read as much. I used to read like a book almost a week. I used to read. I used to be a, a real a big reader. I just finished reading Adrian Tchaikovsky's Children of Time. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. But you know, they basically they do an experiment, and you know, they've got a nanovirus to have the monkeys evolve really quickly and they've got a whole planet where they're going to do it and something goes wrong and the monkeys burn up on burn up on entry but the nanovirus doesn't and because they don't want they didn't want other mammals to get smart they just want the monkeys to get smart um, um they, it's not good for anything but these particular primates but they never bothered to, to make sure that it wasn't good for the spiders or the ants oh, wow. right and so it's like over millennia uh -huh. how these how um these spiders and ants and the and the arachnid you know the the sea creatures all gained intelligence mm -hmm. because of this because of this nanovirus it's an amazing it's an amazing story right yeah so um that same podcast i was talking about lex Friedman, who talked to connor west he's talking to someone else they're talking about you know alien life and stuff yeah and they're talking you know like when alien life comes, who are they going to talk to? Right. Right. Can we assume it's going to be us, right? <laughs> but they might think they're going straight for the whales, man. Yeah, I tell whales, you, whales, spiders, they, dolphins. Yeah. Like who are they going to go to? Right. Yeah. Of course, the guy will do. You know, all the all the cities are with us, whatever. But maybe that's not a challenge for them. Yeah. You know. So. Well, you know that. You know, I one of the things you know the, the environmentalist in me also is you know everything on Earth is made up of, you know, DNA. Yeah. Or it starts with DNA. Yeah. So. So what's the thing you know, we are stardust? Right. But if we, but if you come look at the planet, you really can't tell the difference. If you're looking no. at that level, at the molecular level, you can't tell the difference between a leaf and and me. No, you can't. Right. So and you know that's, and, that's a good point. Maybe you look at a market level. Yeah. I didn't right? think about that. Yeah. Who knows, right? You know, and uh, you know, and we we don't even not not everybody, but we generally, you know. We don't care about talking to dogs or to no, dolphins or no. to octopuses. So. Maybe they come from more like a water-based environment. Exactly right? right. You know, and so you know, I I I really do think that if we were confronted with aliens, we wouldn't even notice that they were there. No, right? They're probably right there. Yeah, we're presuming they look like us. You know, <laughs> right. they might be carbon-based or you know, like yeah, all of know. our science fiction are bipedal. You know. People. Yes. <laughs> so who knew Star Trek was actually a, a, a you know <laughs> exactly. a predictive thing? Yeah. Right. That's crazy. So. So moving on to something else, you already talked about this. Somebody talk more about this. Love is my religion nonprofit. Yeah, it's um, uh, uh, it was started by one of my best friends, and um, and he was just he was interested in having people talk across religions when he first started it off. And then my husband and I joined the board, 
And we looked at like, how, how could we make the biggest difference? And that's when we created these, uh, be heard round tables. And, um, and that was, uh, doing easy topics. We, we've been doing this for almost four years now. And we started off doing easy, easy things like, um, men and women, right? Like having them just share their experience and have the opportunity to be heard. Right. And then, and then one of the things that we realized is where we had the biggest impact was, um, uh, if, if we had a conversation that, that crosses the cultural divide, right? Like the, the, the right to left political spectrum. Um, because especially right now, what, what, I think makes the biggest difference is, is for people to feel connected, right. And to feel like, you know, we, the, you know, it's the really, really vocal that people think, well, that's the way the world is. And it's, it's mostly not. It's not. I said before, I'm a firm believer. If somehow we could take the 1% on the left, 1% on the right and get rid of them, you know, like send them somewhere. Let them go fight it out on an island. Yeah, like give them yeah. the, give them some random island somewhere, right? Because <laughs> yeah, exactly. most people are in the middle, most people have nuance, you know. Like, wait, wait, so much nuance, so much nuance, right? You on know? the right, you know, you have like what's her name? Um, the, the the lady from Georgia, say representative. Uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah, her. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness, like. Yeah, like, they're are not you kidding me. Right, they they're not all like that, but you know, it, it sure sounds like it because she's so freaking loud, right? So, yeah. So, you know, it's nice when they silence, silence her. So, right. Cause at least, you know, the adults can talk, right. Yeah. So she's definitely, I don't know. And so next, um, talk about the, I think it's called the Cohen veterans bioscience. Yeah. So that was, um, so I worked, uh, I worked at the Allen Institute for brain science here in town. And that's where I figured out that I loved to, you know, educating and talking complex, you know, showing people how to use these free resources, um, but I also, while I was there, I realized that we are crap at dealing with data, right? It is, it's just, we're not, we're not good at it, right? You know, there's, there's this whole, whole thing in, in open science about um, having things be fair, right? Findable, accessible, interoperable, reproducible, um, reusable, like, you know, so we had this, this whole world and, and data is hard, right? And data, having data talk to other data is hard, right? And, you know, just, you know, all of the work that I did in my, for my graduate work, right. Just giving that to somebody doesn't make much sense because they don't understand what I called everything. Right. So I, I realized that there was a data problem. And when I worked for Cohen veterans, one of the things that they were, they were putting together was a database for uh, brain science. Right. So let's have all of the, especially in, uh, in this society, right. We fund based on causes, Right. So um, I work on Alzheimer's. Okay. Here's a, here's a pot of money to go solve Alzheimer's and here's a pot of money to go solve Parkinson's and here's a pot of money to solve other neurodegenerative diseases. Right. They're all in the brain though, brain cancer, they're all in the brain, but so you're looking at a, a problem of the brain from a, from a particular view and, and, and people don't talk to each other about them. You know, data is all in, in silos. So the idea was to let's, let's get all of the data and put it all together one spot and harmonize it all so that it talks to each other. So, so that you could, um, so that you can understand holistically how the brain works. So that was the, I, you know, I went to work there and that's also where I, um, I really started to understand what's going on with our veterans, right? You know, the, and the other thing that I liked uh, about the, the uh, Magali Haas is the, is the CEO and she's got this amazing vision. Like, what if we, what if we based the drugs that we use on a mechanism of action instead of a gut feeling, you know, we tripped over Prozac and then drug companies tried to make money off of that and similar things forever. And I, you know, I, I remember a time when that's, it's, you know, finding a new drug is hard, right? It, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to do it. And so a lot of neuro, uh, neuro um, discovery units were shut down because it was just, wasn't bringing in, bringing in any money right <laughs> until psychedelics kicked in and now they're all back on back on board right but um uh so what what they were looking for is like let's actually look and see if there's you know like see if we can find uh, genetic markers can we find markers for ptsd right and everybody said no you know that's you're not gonna not gonna be able to do that and they did 
right? You know, they actually started to show like, you know, this, you know, these genetic markers show a, a, a predisposition for suffering more PTSD, which is good to know, because then, you know, don't have them on the front line, right? You know, like, let's, let's actually be humane about this. And so I loved the whole, the, the whole um, mentality. And, you know, the, I went to a, a veterans, um, a Cohen veterans conference, where that was the first time I'd ever met Beto O'Rourke, right? Because he was just an advocate for veterans, right? It's a hard, hard to be a politician in Texas and not be an advocate for veterans, right? You know, for some reason. Regardless of which side of the political spectrum you're on. Yeah, right. And so, you know, so, um, so I, you know, I, I got connected to, right, like the plight of it, like what they did for us, and then, and then what they're dealing with now, right? And so, you know, that's, so that was, that was a, a short stint I did with them for a while. Um, and from there, they, they actually decided not to use the, the, uh, the software development platform that the software platform that, um, that they'd started using. And that's actually also part of why I, I came there because I was interested in people who were, um, doing the right kinds of things with data. Right. And so that was, my next job then I went to Exaptive, which is the, which is the company, the vendor that, that they, they had been using for their, for their database okay. for the, for the UI. So let's put you have two people, one, like they like had a normal life, no brain trauma, whatever. And you have like a veteran who like, you know, was it either ID or explosive or hit the head real hard. Can you tell the difference in the brain? Uh, well, yeah. Okay. So, so there was a, there was a, uh, I can't remember what sport. Chris, no, I can't remember, no whiskey, what, no, uh, I'm butchering his name. So, but he got his PhD and, um, he was, I think he was in Canadian football league, something he was in someplace, someplace where they hit their heads a lot. And he went into neurosciences because he, they were told that, you know, no, you're fine with concussions, right. You know, like that, that you're fine. Right. But it turns out that you're not fine. Yeah. Right. And, uh, he, he actually convinced, I think it was, um, over 400, uh, football players to donate their brains yeah. once they passed. And that's a big thing right now. Yeah. Football and, players donate brains. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's because of this man. Right. Um, and I forgotten his name. I should probably send it to you. So it's, hey, man, can you imagine being a boxer, you know, like exactly at right? least football, I mean, you get a lot of football, but you're boxing. Like, and, and like one thing, like if you're boxing or like UFC, or whatever, it's not the actual fight, but it's all the sparring you're doing, right? Exactly. Over and over and over. And of course, it's not as hard hitting, but still, a hit's a hit. It is. And it, and it's not so much the hit itself, but it's the it's the second and the third and the 11th and the 25th yeah, hit. After, yeah, exactly. So that's where, that's what CTE comes in, right? And um, and so uh, when you look at, when you look at brains, you can actually tell. Okay. And so um, it, in the, in his PhD study, there was 110 brains that he looked at and 109 of them, something like that, right? 109 of them showed signs of CTE. So yeah. you could actually, you could see, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes when they're in, um, when the damage is in different areas of the brain, right? It impacts, it, it impacts areas like, especially the frontal lobe, right? Where you, all of the executive function, where decision-making and risk, risk and all that gets damaged, right? Then, you know, then you've got some of the emotional things that go on as well. So can brain damage be reversed? Depends. Okay. Right. I, you know, we, we know, so what's the brain, right? The central nervous system is also the spinal cord, right? And we, we know that it's really hard to fix the spinal cord, right? My, um, my, my aunt is actually, she was in a, she was hit by a drunk driver and has some damage up in the, in the sea. C region of her, of her neck. And, um, and she's, uh, she may actually be classified as a quadriplegic, but she had a hard time. So she's actually with machines and rehab and all this uh, therapy, she's actually uh, been able to like, to walk with assisted. Right. But, um, but nothing will pay for pay for that treatment because yeah. it is right. That, you know, the, the common knowledge is the brain can't be, the brain can't be healed. Um, however, there's a, there's a book called by Dr. Norman Deutsch that's, that's called the brain that heals itself. And it talks about several, several people who, and it's because the people who are treating them didn't know any better, you know, um, actually went about, went about, uh, their recovery 
like you like you could you could be re, you could be healed right so there was a there was a gentleman who had a, a massive stroke and his son you know just started from scratch again started from like build up his muscles so he could crawl and then he could walk again and then you know he had to redistinguish and he had to relearn and and, and he he recovered full you know all of his faculties he recovered everything it took a couple of years um but then uh and he died of a heart attack you know i don't know doing some doing something great like i don't know climbing grand canyon <laughs> or something right but when they went but they went and they looked back at his brain there was like 97 percent of his brain or some in, incredible amount of his brain had been damaged but there but there's enough redundancy in the brain that you can teach yourself you can teach yourself to do things again that's the that's the amazing thing about the brain the brain will do whatever it is you tell it to right but most people say things like well i can't do that yeah right which is you telling telling yourself that you can't do that thing but if you let go of all of that let go of all of your preconceived notions around that you could learn to do something even even older, like you could learn to do math, you could learn a new language, you could learn to play tennis, right? You're, so it's more of a fact you being lazy versus being able to learn. It's, I, I hate the word lazy, right? Because, you know, it's not, it's, you know, when, if, if you ever been working out, like I, I remember the first time I got a coach, right? And I was doing leg presses, right? And there was, there was a point where my mind said, okay, you're done. You can't yeah. do this anymore. Yeah. And they said, you got like five or six left in you. Yeah. And I did. Yeah. Right. So your brain, your brain is just really powerful and it will do whatever. Right. And so when it said that I'm done, right. You know, so you've got to, you've got to go beyond that yeah, and you've got to keep my mind over matter. Like exactly. Right. You know, you gotta, you know, if you just, and if you just practice something, right. You know, one of the things that I took on recently was watercolor. Right. You know, and you know, so I just keep practicing it. Right. I'm awful at it. Right. Because for the longest time I told myself that I wasn't artistic. And I'm, and I'm like, well, that's silly, right? Yeah, I, you know? I tell myself the same thing. I tell myself, I can't even draw a stick figure. <laughs> right, exactly. But if you, if you just practice, yeah. if you just practice, right, you know? So I heard this some somewhere, like, if you just like pick any discipline, right? Like watercoloring, right? If you just practice one hour a week for a year, you'd be better than 95% of the population. Exactly. That's it. Because you're not, you're not, you're not going to get paid for it. Right. But you'd be 95% better than the population. Because your brain will do whatever you tell it to. It will. It will learn anything. So have you heard of this? So I think 1800s, there was like a, um, some type of mine in France. They're doing explosives. And so this guy mixed calculated. And so there's like something got stuck in his head, right? It was like, it, it like literally stick out, right? Oh, the, 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 what's this? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And he, and like he should have been dead. He lived like 50, 60 years. They studied his brain. Like he had a normal life, but this thing was out of his head and they didn't want to take it out because you no, know, obviously he would die, right? Oh, okay. This is not, uh, well, they, they eventually, the, the one that I, what's Phineas, Phineas yes, Gage, Phineas, yeah, Phineas Gage. Yeah. yeah, they did take it out. Oh, did they? Okay. they did take it out, okay. but, but his personality was forever changed. Yeah, yeah. Right. It actually, it actually changed his person. See, that's the other thing about the brain, right? You know, um, so, so, so they took it out. Oh, so, oh yeah. They took it out. Okay. Um, but, but some, the, the part of the brain that, um, the, there, there was something about um, anger and aggression and all that, whatever, whatever put the stop on that was, was damaged. Right. And so then he was just, you know, out of control. Right. Yeah. He turned out, turned out to be a horrible person, all that. So, so there's, there's a getting, getting into the nuances of brain science again here. Right. You know, there, there's the, there's the whole world of um, that, you know, if, if what makes you, you is the brain and I'm, I'm questioning that, but you know, there, there are aspects of the brain that it is entirely biological, right? You know, David Eagleman is one of my favorite neuroscientists and he talks about this in one of his books. Um, there was a, there was a man who developed a, uh, a penchant for child pornography, right? And you don't talk about that because that's like, you know, you know, so it was like this shameful secret that he and his wife kept, um, uh, you know, she hated it and all, all of this, right. He hated it too. He hated that about himself. But then, um, and then he was like, uh, had these debilitating migraines. And at one point he had to be taken to the ER for it. And they realized they did a scan. They found he had a brain tumor, right? So they put him into surgery, took out the brain tumor, penchant for neuro, for, for, uh, child pornography went away. Yeah, It was a function. 
it was a function of a cancer. Okay. Right. So like there was, there was like something in his brain that, that developed into this, it's kind of weird, right. But very complex, um, psych- psychology, like behavior. Right. And, uh, and then, uh, and then later, um, when the, uh, when the pension came back, right. Uh, his wife said immediately his tumor's back and they yeah. went and they looked and it was back. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, you know, that it, it just goes to point to that, you know, the way we develop and the way that our brains are developed, right. Can result in, right. You know, after reading his book, my, my uncle was a federal defender, right. I want, I want to write a book with him, you know, where, you know, he talked about some of the weirdest crimes that he ever had to yeah, deal with, I but imagine. I want to, I want to talk about the neuro, you know, neuro, you know, like physically, was there something in, in the brain that could have, could have caused that. Yeah. Right. So there's, you know, there's a, you know, there's all sorts of interesting questions like free will and all that, you know, in in the brain. So, so on a scale from one to 100, what percentage of the brain do we really know about? Oh my God. I can't even answer that. We know. So there, we know so much and we know so little, yeah. right. You know, um, and the, and the other thing about it is that what's, what's really great is that you are uniquely you, right? And that has to do with all of the things that have happened to you in your life and all of the thoughts you've had and all of the, um, all of the experiences that you've had, right? And, you know, and so, um, so that has you be uniquely you and your brain is, you know, like the different connections that it's made. It's like nobody else is in the world. Right. You know, so we, we do know like the basic cabling, right. You know, we know that, you know, there are connections to the, to the, you know, to the different areas of the cortex from the striatum. We know that like, there's like, you, you've laid the basic cabling, but the, the actual connections down at the, at the cellular level, which produce the things that we think and the memories and all that kind of stuff are different. So, um, so, you know, do we, we know where genes are expressed in the brain, right? We do know that, right? We know, uh, we know a little bit less about what proteins are expressed where, because gene expression doesn't, doesn't map onto protein expression, right? And proteins are the things that build the, you know, build the structure. Like there's, there's, there's stuff. And I, I, so I can't answer that because to, uh, to answer that question, I'd have to know what a hundred percent was. Right. And, and, you know, that was a very scientific answer. Yeah, well, exactly. Right. <laughs> but there's like nuance in that, right? You know, I can yes. give you a number, but then I could never back it up. Yeah. Right. So. Do you think we're at the point where we can do brain transplants? Uh, I doubt it. Okay. You know, cause we, I don't, who knows, right. I don't, you know, maybe, you know, there's a, um, there is a, uh, a dissection at McMaster university in Canada where they have dissected everything away except for the nerves, right? And so you've got this, right? It's the, you know, the peripheral nerves are still part of the brain, right? You know, it's just an arbitrary, it's an ar- arbitrary thing that we say, like there's the outside the brain and inside the brain, right? But where does that, where does that ha- end, right? So um, to actually take the brain out right. And put it into some, there's just so many connections that would need to be remade that it doesn't make sense. I, I, I so think we have to reach for aliens to come give us a technology. To do ex- that. Ex- or, or, you know, I think it's way more likely that we'd be able to upload a consciousness at some point than to be able to do a brain transplant. So, you know, and so, and who knows, right. I'm, I've been reading a bunch of science fiction about transfer of consciousness, which yeah. is awesome. Right. So have you, have you watched a show called um, Your Million? It comes on that geo. So basically, it's your million, like stuff like futuristic scientific stuff. Oh no, yeah, yeah. No, so I one, seen of, it. so one of it is like um, these uh, this um, their this this couple's daughter's about to die. So this asking the limo, do we upload her? No, basically, it was like, do we make her an android? She stays around forever. Right. The wife wants to upload her consciousness to live forever. The husband doesn't want to. You know. Mm-hmm. Another thing was like, you know, in the future, like suppose you um, come down with cancer. You get an injection of cancer fighting robots, little tiny yeah. yeah, and they kill the cancer, you know, all kinds of future stuff, right? Yeah, that's, that's that one's off. even closer. That yeah. one's even closer than, yeah, but you know, that stuff is, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Like there's, there is so much stuff that, that, that we could, you know, have you, have you watched Black Mirror at all? 
No. Black Mirror is awesome. Okay. Right. Check it out. It's just, it's just science fiction about, but it's like, you know, technology gone wild. And there's, you know, there's this, there, there's one, what you just said reminded me of one of the episodes where um, uh, a woman's husband died. Right. And she's just like grieving, you know, like she's got a whole, like a whole bunch of grief going on. And this company calls and said, well, you know, there's enough there is enough uh, sound recordings of him and we could do this now, yeah. right? There's enough companies sound, that do that right now. The sound recordings of him that we could like let you talk to him via the phone, right? Yeah. Just to, you know, and so, you know, she would talk and then, you know, th then it gets better and they says, well, you know, we could actually upload into an, into a body. So this body comes, right? Yeah. And it's like, it looks just, but it's, but it's, it's interesting because there's one point where she's like, you know, like apparently he's horrible in bed because he never puts that stuff on Facebook. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's yeah. like a lot of the, the internal stuff that they could never know. Yeah. That just makes that, that creature, that thing that they created really shallow mm -hmm. because it's just all the good stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, that they didn't, you know, it doesn't talk about any of the difficult times or the negative emotions. Cause you know, most people don't want to talk about that. No. I'm a firm believer that whatever you can imagine, you can do. Right. But yeah. Maybe not right now. Like, no, go back to Star Trek in the sixties, you know, with the, Flip phones, the microwave ovens, all the stuff they did. Now that's all true, right? You know, right. And and who's to say that that it's uh, we have that now because somebody imagined it once, yeah. right? You know, like like you said, right? You know, it's we can do whatever we imagine. You know, it's a it's it's a there's a lot of amazing things that they do on that that I like to think about in Black Mirror, right? Yeah. Because it's like what what it comes on? Where's it come on? I, uh, it must be Netflix. It must be Netflix. Netflix, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, some, it's like a TV show. It's TV a, show? yeah. If you're going to watch it, don't watch the first episode. Okay. Don't watch it because it, that one is like shocking. Mm -hmm. Right. And who needs to see prime minister fucking a pig. Right. What? So, yes, exactly. So it's just like, if you watch that one and like, that's your introduction to yeah. it, it's kind of like, well, yeah. this is a stupid show. I'm yeah. not watching these. So watch, you know, watch them in any order that okay. they come that, that, um, that just strikes your fancy, right. You know, there's, there's a, there's a terrifying episode that I loved, right. You know, so there's, there's a lot of episodes, but so, and you've got like five seasons now to, okay. to choose from. So, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank goodness we were able to binge watch TV shows now. Right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. And this is one of the ones where don't watch it in order. Cause you don't have to, it's okay. like, cause every episode is, it's like, it's like twilight zone only on steroids. <laughs> right. So next let's talk about your first love astronomy. Yeah. So what got you interested in astronomy back in the day? <laughs> okay. So um, I was eight years old and I walked into the library and my best friend was reading a book. And I said, uh, I said, what are you reading? And he said, oh, you wouldn't be interested in it. It's a, it's a book on astronomy and girls don't do astronomy. So I was eight years old when I decided I was going to be an astronomer. And, and it was, it wasn't, there was no malice. Despite him. It wasn't despite anything. <laughs> there was no malice, but I was just, I was just confronted with, you can't do this. And I'm like, yeah, I can. Right. And so 11 years later, um, I'm a freshman, uh, in college and, uh, I'm, I'm crunching numbers at the very large array in, in New Mexico on the plains of San Augustine. It's that's the radio telescope. That's got the 27 different, um, telescopes, you know, um, Jody Foster in contact that, yeah. that one, yeah. I was working there and I was like, what the hell am I doing here? I don't want to do this. Right. And so it was, so I, I just did it is because it was a decision that I made when I was eight years old. So, um, there was no, uh, there was no thinking or exploring or anything about it. So, uh, so I got my physics degree and, um, and then, you know, I started to do environmental sciences as well. Cause I liked, I've always been a tree hugger. Yeah. Right. And that's, and then I took a couple of biology classes and I found G protein coupled receptors. That's what, that's, that's what had me on this path now. Um, but I've, but, uh, you know, I still love, I still love the stars and yeah. I still love, you know, the, everything that, you know, astronomy and the, the idea of science fiction and space exploration and all of that stuff. Right. But, um, but you know, how, how I started and, and it was actually, um, you know, when I, I saw on Facebook once there was somebody who lived next door to somebody who'd gotten a letter from Carl Sagan. Right. And they, they'd asked, they'd written Carl Sagan and they asked him, what classes, what astrophysics classes should I take um, as an undergrad? And his response was, don't take any astrophysics classes. Yeah. Just get your basics in physics first and then go into, into um, astronomy studies, 
astronomical studies. And I really wish that somebody had told me that because, um, you know, I started to take uh, astronomy classes while I was in college, right? And and actually worked there without having all of the background knowledge that I needed, right? Like, you know, without uh, working my way through differential equations and all that stuff. And so um, it would have been, I think I may actually still have been there had I not jumped straight into astrophysics, right? If I'd actually just gotten my physics degree and then and then went into it when I when I had a, ba- a, a broader understanding of it. I'm thinking to watch all these James Webb photographs coming back. I know, they're amazing. I mean, it's like, I, I, I make this every day, they find like thousands of new galaxies. Exactly. Exactly. It's awesome. It's awesome. And yeah. it's just the stuff that they're showing and the, the fact that it's it's not matching predictions no. just makes me so happy. It's just because it's, you know, it's a freaking uh, mystery. Yeah, the whole and, they're thing. Like, and they're like pointed at dark space, right? There's nothing there. Oh, shit. There's a lot there's, there. There's stuff there, here. there too, right? <laughs> and yeah. like, you know, like, yeah. I mean, of all the million of planets, just based on stats, has to be something out there, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Has to be something out there, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I know one thing just to me, like a lot of people like, we want the aliens to come. Like, do you want the aliens to come? Like, <laughs> like do you really want them to come? Like, can we meet well, somewhere else? Like middle of the universe? No. Do you want them to come here first? You know, like there's there the bad things could happen to us. Yeah, there's a lot of different, you know, so all we've got is our imaginations on this again, right? You know, and so science fiction is amazing for this, right? You know, and so um uh Jin Chin Jin Lu, he's a he's a Chinese author who wrote to three but it's such such a great story and it's hard science fiction so yeah. you know we find we find out that there's other people right and we you know we find out you know we communicate with them you know and then uh and then so they they decided that our planet looks way more looks way more uh uh, uh, uh because you know in their world there's there's three different suns and yeah. so they have to dehydrate and mm-hmm. you know and so like the, the whole world's unstable and the idea of having a stable planet they love that yeah. so they're heading our way right but it's going to take them 400 years to get here right which is amazing right because then you've got the story playing out of like what do we do knowing yeah. that knowing that these people are coming and they're way advanced than us and all that kind of stuff right you know so and it's so it's uh it, it's, it's a fascinating story it's an amazing 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 story. Here's one for you. This is how you, I think you take up Earth, right? I suppose there's an alien, alien, well, aliens out there, right? Right. More, more advanced with us, everything, right? Yeah. They come study us. If I was them, I would just send one person, right? You just send one person? Yeah. Yeah. But the person says, I'm God. Yeah. I'm God or all of the case to be Buddha, and you show your power, whatever, you know. And yeah. Then, like, that's it. There's, okay, there's so many, there are so many stories based on that as well, you know. Um, but the, uh, like the, the, the Tchaikovsky one, right. That the whole thing was, you know, they sent the monkeys down and all this and they, they had put somebody in a sleeping pod and they were going to be God, uh-huh. right. They were going to be God, you know, yeah. to these, to these creatures They they literally are God. Yeah. Right. Which also makes me think, you know, when I, you know, I, I think it's of all the creation stories, I think um, genetically modified humans is probably what I mean, happened. You don't There's so many creation stories. Like you don't realize like there's so many, so many of them are the same though. Yeah, they are. Right, they like, are the there's same. So, there's so many like Noah's Ark stories to different places. You know, there's so many like, right? Like people don't there's so many like you know, the virgin birth of you know whatever whatever you know yeah. dating back to the they're way- all goddess and goddess and child god yeah. and goddess and child right yeah so but but you know when you if you if you think about you know we keep talking about you know to any uh, to any beings. And if an efficient, you know, uh, sufficiently advanced technology mm-hmm. will look like magic. Yeah. Right. You know, so, you know, the, you know, the way they talk about, you know, in the Bible, they talk about how, um, Eve was, was made from the rib. Yeah. It turns out that that's, it's not the rib, right. It's, it's just from a half of a man, mm-hmm. right. It just sounds to me like they took, you know, rep- reproductive, you know, like the DNA from one half yeah. reproductive from another half and they put them together and, you know, created what we are here. Yeah. You know, we we were probably some of the apes that were walking mm-hmm. around, right? Just and then, you know, with God, right? Yeah. You know, whatever those. And then this thing that says, you know, like the Bible says, the Earth was many seven days, but you know, some people say, well, each day is actually a thousand years to God. You know, yeah. And then you're like, okay, we had to come some firmware, right? So, but did a God create us? I don't know. Then again, are you telling me that two small atoms just bang together and this all happened? 
that's, you know, like who knows, uh, right. Yeah. You know, given enough time, everything will happen. Yeah. Right. Like the whole theory about, you know, you'll eventually get a, you get enough monkeys banging away on a computer. Eventually somebody, eventually one of them will do the Shakespeare's works. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah, like true. random, you know, you give enough time and, you know, which is why scientists like to study uh, like Drosophila, right. Those flies. Cause they've got a, a you know, I think they die within a day. Right. So they've got an entire lifespan happening within a day. Yeah. Right. So you can, you can do evolutionary studies on them. Like you can, you know, you can change something and then watch what happens. Where do, where do they evolve to? Do you think the human race is actually getting smarter or we've been the same level of smartness or dumbness since the beginning of time? Of course, technology gotten better, right? Yeah. But, but the basic human being, have we gotten That's any smarter? That's a good smarter? question, right? I don't, uh, I think you argue we've gotten more ethical, more moral. I think you make that argument, but I've actually gotten smarter. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because you know we were we went to the uh, I was I was saying we went to the museum the the Museum of Flight yesterday, <laughs> and they were they were getting ready. You know, and if you've watched um, Hidden Figures, right? Yeah, yeah, you know they're getting ready to launch a uh, a rocket, right? And they've got these these notebooks. They're flipping through pages, right, on these notebooks, and I, I was like. Like they didn't, they didn't have computing power. So what, what do you mean by smart? Right. That's a good point. You know, because, because yeah. yeah, obviously a different types of smarts. Who's, and... who's to say that, that, right. Like who's to say somebody who speaks to spirits isn't smart. Right. You know, like there's some people who would say, well, that's definitely not smart. Right. But, um, you know, we, I used to be able to remember phone numbers. And in fact, I oh, no, that's done. Right. But you yeah. don't, you don't need to do that anymore, you know, but that used to be a measure that, that of how of smart brain you are. For something else. Exactly. Right. So um, like, what is, what does smart mean? Right. You know, uh, um, you know, I would argue uh, being able to make leaps, right. You know, that, that aren't like logically following, you know, I, I've got a novel in my brain somewhere about, you know, how, um, like the people who are really innovative, like make just, they make a leap that it's like, they yeah. didn't follow a path, but they could, they could jump a chasm. Yeah. Right. And have, have something come together. Right. I, I definitely, there's like a bunch of generations people come along, like, you know, obviously Leonard da Vinci, like Nikolai Tesla. Maybe, but you know, maybe that's just, okay. So, you know, maybe that's just white privilege, right. You know, who's to say. I mean, that's that like, all this stuff happened in Africa, Asia. You exactly. Know, who's to China say? China was so far ahead of us and everything. How many? Who's to say? How many Beethovens? How many? How many Einsteins? That um, we don't know about. That yet. we don't know about because you know they died early because of dysentery. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't I mean, have we don't clean know about water. Because they had like you know, lug water two miles a day for a dollar a day or something. Because they grew up in Flint. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Flint. Flint yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like what's who's that's the whole thing about smart like what is that you know if you oh there's 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 so many comics about how if you if you judge a fish by how, um, whether or not they can climb a tree yeah, they're gonna yeah. look they're yeah gonna the look. meme like you have the final test climb a tree you got the fish and all this different right. stuff you know and like and it's just the monkeys right yeah. you know so you know and that's how we measure smart right you know that for a long time we were we were really clear that that you know i remember when i was growing up i was like what do you mean? You know? Yeah, of course they do. What's yeah, exactly. What do you, what do you mean by that? Right. Yeah. You know, and, and first that's of blas all, that's blasphemous right there. Right. But you know, first of all, how did they figure that out? One yeah. out, right. You know, they just had an idea and they're like that, that uh, doesn't conform to my worldview. So, so this popped my mind. So, so when x-rays first came out, supposedly when someone was dying, they would try to take a, uh, use to put the x-ray to try to try to take the x-ray of the soul, leaving the body. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I don't think, so, huh, so there, there's a, there's a whole world of like, what is consciousness, yeah. right? You know, I, you know, I worked at, at the Allen Institute with Christoph Koch, and he's probably one of the foremost researchers on consciousness. Mm -hmm. And for years, for a long decades, he's been looking for neural correlates of consciousness, right? And so, you know, what if, what if it isn't, what if it isn't low in the brain, right? who knows, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe there is a locus of consciousness in the brain, but it's looking more and more like it's not, that's not the case. Right. You know, there's like, you know, is it a, an emergent property of complexity? Who knows? Right. There's just so many theories now. So, so. talk about this, like, so like, but you're, you're, you're by yourself, you're watching TV, whatever your case may be. And then a moon pops your head of you having like, you know, Brownies with grandmother. 
Yeah. And then it's like fixes to like you're playing baseball. Yeah. And like all these names are popping out and out and they have nothing to do with each other, right? Right. What's well, that about? It's not. How does that work? Like there's no correlation. Like, well, to me, there's no correlation, right? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Yeah. Well, I'd like you to consider that there is. Like that's how the brain learns things is is you associate things. So you'll find yourself like, you know, you'll, you'll, so you'll go like, on a tangent, right. And yeah. you'll, you know, you're thinking about a yellow pencil and then you think about a school bus. And then the last time you were on a school bus and then that person, and I saw that person look just like that part, you know, like, and so it, it is connected. So I guess there's a very phrase that like, you start with number one, we say oranges and thought number 10 is like something like nowhere close to oranges. Like how's that thing go? Yeah. It's so, but it is, it is a, it is a path, right. You know, how we learn is we associate things with something that we know. And that's also how, how the memory works is right. So you can, you know, you can find yourself. And uh, so I was saying about meditation, right? I, like I, for a long time, I tried to meditate and I couldn't meditate. And, uh, and then I started meditating with Sam Harris. So he's a neuroscientist. And I like to think that what he did is he's, he's got enough background on how the brain works that he really does just help you trick yourself into meditating. And, um, you know, one of the, a lot of what his meditations look like are just you noticing all of the stuff that comes up, like any sensations you have from sitting, right? Um, and then and then noticing like sounds that happen and then noticing like thoughts that come up. And, and, and his whole thing is like, notice that you're not doing any of that. All of that stuff is just doing it naturally, right? So your brain, you know, so like you have got no, uh, you've got no control over the different sounds. Like people will walk in and yeah. the birds will, you know, and all that. But it happens over here in your consciousness, right? Um, and you're and the and then there's the the thoughts that you have that just you don't even you don't even have to think to yourself, okay, I'm gonna think about elephants, right? It's just like all of a sudden you're like on this like this path and all of a sudden elephants show up, right? You know, it's so um so perhaps consciousness is just a space in which all of that arises. So he does a great job. And so, you know, you find yourself meditating and you find yourself starting to get really good at meditating, just allowing your brain to do what it does. And then yeah. just to notice what it's doing. Also, it's amazing. Like except when you was a little kid, like when I was a little kid, I used to stay with my grandparents for the summertime, right? Yeah. Every day I walked my grandmother to the post office. Every day we go to the local corner store, general store, you buy me orange soda and a thing of Starbucks. Yeah. So whenever I see orange soda, the Starbucks, right. I like my heart melts, right? Yeah. And if someone says they don't like Starbucks, like you're the devil. Oh, exactly. <laughs> you're right. The demon. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> oh, what the fuck's wrong with you? Because it's because it's like it's got such a thing in your heart, yeah. right? You know, and so which is also where we start um getting all xenophobic about people. That's true. Right. Yeah. You know, because uh, you know, I remember I remember so you're saying don't tell call people don't like Starbucks demons. I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> remember somebody telling me like you can't like peter gabriel that's his music is just awful yeah. and i'm like, I like but I, I do yeah i like i'm a big fan i like it i like it too. yeah right but the idea that i like it's wrong for me to like what i, I like right yeah. it's just it's just kind of weak you know heavy metal and i'm like i don't yeah. understand so something totally random right yeah back to sonic decadelics yeah okay anyone says to me no one could tell me that Liz Zeppelin didn't make all the music on LSD. <laughs> like, okay, what you say? They made that music on LSD. You Just, know, I had a. You can't, you can't. There's no way you can convince me otherwise. I had a. Oh, I should share a, a playlist with you. Um, uh, that's just a friend of mine. You know, you know, he did a lot of acid when he was when he was younger. But you know, there's there's a like. I had a friend, there was a bunch of us sitting around, and this this guy was really straight laced, and he was like, "Why would anybody smoke marijuana?" Like, why would anybody do that to themselves? And, and, you know, a bunch of us potheads are sitting around yeah. and, and, uh, and one of them said, because of music. Yeah. And, uh, he was like, what? And he says, music is totally different oh, yeah. when you're high. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and so, and, and uh, it's, it's funny. Cause I, and, and so I, like, I was exposed to a lot of Jethro Tull and Moody blues and all this, all this psychedelic music. And then when I went back to listen to it as a teenager, I'm like, I don't understand. Right. Like, cause there was definitely a, like a space for that. Right. And then, um, you know, then when I started uh, getting interested in psychedelics, right. And then there's something that happens with music, yeah. right. Like the way your brain uh, yeah. takes in it music, so it's amazing. Right. And so, and you know, the, so this, this is also, so I was raised Catholic and, uh, uh, you know, a long time. Um, and mostly because, uh, the music is so amazing, right? Like they, you know, there's a, 
the composers there, they knew how to mess with the mind, right? Yeah. You know, and uh, and it's, you, like you'll listen to some of them, some of them, like there are some composers that are synesthetes, mm -hmm. right? Which means that they can see colors. I mean, yeah. they can hear colors, right? So like like um, a, a note has a particular color to them, right? And um, if you listen to their music, sometimes it sounds a little off, but once you realize they're synesthetes, it's, it's yeah. seeing the music, right? And so it's got a, you know, that particular note combination, you know, uh, did something in their visual field, right? You know, that, so which I'm fascinated by, right? And so that's one of and the things like, about- And it all syncs together. Yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, on psilocybin, right? I, you know, if you've got your eyes closed and you're listening to music and you start to see colors, just, it, you know, as, as an experiment, right? Because everything's an experiment, yeah. right? Just notice that the same note gives you the same I did that once right and I was like wow it's the same color each the note is always the same color so I was watching the the color shift but I could I could relate it to the actual sound and I'm like this is synesthesia this is amazing yeah one time right. I, I was on it and like I was looking at Liz Deppelin I was watching like a nature show like sea creature stuff and like all the sea creatures were like lip syncing perfectly to Liz Deppelin <laughs> like I, I know what it's like you know like uh, yeah you know, like yeah 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 so, it's, it's, it's insane it's a uh, it's it cracks me up how um how uh cannabis is so dangerous right but if you know if you watch you know i've i've uh, had my my kids right you know uh, when they had their friends over um i'm not saying whether or not they were in college or not yet but you know but they uh all they wanted to do was turn on animal planet right yeah. or blue planet right and watch that oh, and yeah. i'm like really that's, that's the indicator yeah, I'm like, is that, that might be an indicator. Yeah, exactly. Is that, you know, that's dangerous, do you, really? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, one thing about marijuana, like, I know some people are out there, they say, you know, happens to be focused, energetic. Some people say, like, oh man, I can't do anything on it. So, I think it definitely affects people different ways. Well, so let's a little brain science there. Okay. Right. So, um, the most abundant receptor in the brain is the cannabinoid receptor. Then I know that it means it's everywhere. Right, which is why people people use it for anxiety. Mm -hmm. People also get anxious when they're on it. They get paranoid while they're on it. People use it to sleep. People use it for their appetite. People use it for pain. People okay. use it for being creative, because um, the different the different strains, the different yeah. terpenes. I, I have a work. good friend. Like he, he tells me like he has an anger problem. He said he, he feels so angry. He takes like a ten mg anvil, yeah. and then he's like, right, anger's gone. Yeah. So there's so it's those receptors are everywhere in the brain. Right. And so like the, the question that I think is fascinating is like, well, why are they everywhere in the brain? What are we, what are they doing? Right. You know, it's yeah. so the cannabinoid receptor yeah. researchers, they were fascinating. They were, I'm sure they were all potheads as well, because, you know, you can't study such an interesting, such an interesting drug that has such interesting phenomenon and not want to like yeah. understand what it is that's ha happening. For One thing I do kind of wish, like when I was growing up, you know, yeah, you came back, dime bag of weed. Now you now you go to the store, the dispensary. How do you want to feel? Here's twenty thousand options. Like, exactly, right? Like you can drink it, smoke it. Like, no, it's too many options. Well, it's um because there's there's a lot of different com. It's, it's such a combinatorics problem. It's yeah. awesome. But you know, I remember when I when I um I first went into a, a dispensary, and I was like, uh, uh, okay, so it's been twenty years since I've done and he says oh yeah okay hold on right and he pulls start out, off at, at the kitty level right well no he he pulls out um some ACDC mm -hmm. which is primarily CBD and he says so first thing you got to know is this is this this shit is way stronger than it was yeah. 20 years ago oh, yeah. so if you get a little green which means you start getting sick from being too high take a little of this yeah right and I was like okay that is some information that's good good yeah. to have right good information. and then I said well I like feeling giggly and all this kind of yeah. stuff and then I learned a whole lot a bunch of stuff like I was like I thought for sure I, I don't like indicas, mm -hmm. right? But now, right? Yeah, you know, I mostly I do edibles now because yeah. you know I I don't like the I don't like smoking, mm -hmm. except when I'm with my dad. He's got yeah. these amazing double water rigs that are awesome. So I don't uh, it doesn't you know my dad's been a been a pothead since he was a teenager. So you know, but um so there's uh you know there, you get to tweak it any mm -hmm. any way you want, right? Yeah. And um you know my uh. My mother-in-law, when she was dealing with cancer, it was, it was, you know, for a long time, you know, she's kind of conservative. So she's like, no, I'm not going to try that. That's yeah. like drugs are bad, you know, the whole thing. But then she was like, okay, I, it, cause she has adverse uh, experiences with, with narcotics. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're like, you know, it would, 
for pain for for pain mediation you know that might that might actually be good so she finally said that she wanted to do that but you know you should talk to somebody who so the 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 cannabis that her other son bought her was um high in thc so she got really really high yeah. right and you know there are some there are some uh strains that are narcotic like so she yeah. had the same experience that she did on narcotics right yeah. so you know so that was like she's like okay i'm done right which is too bad you know she should have had a, like a heavy cbd with maybe yeah. a tiny tiny bit of thc but but again if you've got if you're in prohibition you can't even study that stuff no. you can't even talk about about the different and now you know now we can at least start to talk about all the different yeah. things like what is it what is it that makes me giggle yeah right? like me I, I can't do indica if i do indica i'm out like I'm but out. but if you want to be out that's the perfect thing to do yeah uh so i can't remember his name he lives in edmonds so he has a show on pbs where he travels all over the world over around the world and stuff rick steves rick steves he's, he's a like, he is an advocate for oh, yeah. for the cannabis yeah yes. he is. he's like you know my grandmother takes this yeah for pain you telling me some of my grandmother takes to make her life better is illegal. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Exactly. You know? Right. Well, it's the whole, the whole thing about like making, uh, so here's the, this is one aspect of the, of the whole psychedelic re renaissance that I am like, I find very troubling, which is the, you know, the drug companies, like I said, they stumbled on Prozac. Right. And now they're like, Ooh, this stuff is good. So how do we, how do we uh, patent psilocybin? Yeah. Right. Like hat, you don't. Right. But the way you can do it is you can create a molecule that's not psilocybin. That's not like in any plant medicines, but that has the same kind of effect. Right. And so, and they're looking for like, well, let's, let's see if we can isolate the antidepressant aspect of it. Yeah. And cause then what they can do is they can patent that, put it in a bottle and give it to you the rest of your life. Right. Like it's the next Prozac kind yeah. of thing. So, you know, I, you know, I, I talked, I talked to a friend of mine and she says, yeah, we're, we're taking the fun out of fungi. And I was like, <laughs> okay, but why would you do that? Right. You know, cause like, what if, so for, so for me, like the, there's a lot of people who advocate for why would you experience pain while you're in labor? Right. And, you know, you know, and a lot of spiritual traditions would talk about it being transformative, right. Yeah. You know, like there, but I also agree with like, you know, pain that's like chronic pain, you should, you know, I'm, I'm also, um, I'm training to be a hospice volunteer, right? And, you know, one of the things about hospice is like, you know, pain, you know, treating, treating the pain actually yeah. helps the, the quality of life. Yeah. But, you know, so the, the, there's the whole thing about it being transformative, like being able to, to move through the space, right? So, I was saying that. For I some mean, reason. one good thing about pain, if you have pain, at least you know you know you're alive, right? Exactly. So it's a living experience. So I mean, yeah. pain can be good, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, there, yeah. yeah, my uh, my stepmom who had esophageal cancer, right? She she treated a lot of that. That's like that's pain because she can't breathe, right? And because yeah. there's something growing in her chest that they can't get out, right? You know, like that's that's a good that's a good kind of pain to treat with with medication. And it's, you know, I mean, like I, people have different pain. What's the word of uh, pain? Um, oh man. Um, like pain, uh, not limitations, but a pain. Um, we have like different pain levels, right? Like yeah. my oh. pain level is different for your yes. thresholds. Threshold pain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah pain yeah, thresholds. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that one. Uh, yeah. Right. Like, like for me, it's fun. Like, you know, if you hit me in my mouth or my chest, I'm okay. But if you pinch me, I'm yeah. crying like a bitch. <laughs> like if you pinch me, I'm crying like a bitch. <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny too, because that's, you know, one of the things they talk about consciousness and, you know, if you actually really think about it, like your experience, I have no idea what you're experiencing in here right now. Mm -hmm. I like, I'm experiencing my, what's going on with, you know, all of this stuff in here, but um, who knows, like our, you know, I'm just assuming that your experience is the same as mine. Yeah. Right. And but it can't be. It, it, we have different backgrounds, different brains, different everything. Right. I right. Mean, right. So which how much of this stuff is and like I've done is, this like hundreds of times. Right. Like, I don't know how many times you've done a podcast, you know, oh, so. you're in my environment, you know, big, bright ass light. <laughs> I'm asking these random ass questions, you know. Exactly, right. So, yeah, there is that that whole aspect of it. Right. You know, and so it's uh, thinking like you're the expert, at everything. I'm not an expert. I'm just being curious, asking questions like you might be like. These are fucking dumbass questions they're asking, right? Yeah. Or you might, you know, you never know. You never know, right? You know, that's that's why I appreciate you asking the question. Is there anything you want me to ask you? And I'm like, yeah. Nah. Yeah. 
right? You know, let's just, let's, let's, let's have this be a meandering, meandering pond kind of thing, right? So pond, river, river. That's what's the, your, that's the bourbon. What's your favorite publication you've done so far and why? My favorite publication? That you've done. That either you had the most out of, had most impact, or you just had the most fun doing, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, so I, uh, My dissertation, nobody's read that, right? Nobody's read my dissertation, but it really was. Well, hopefully your panel read it. Right, exactly, <laughs> right? But it, it's, it's, um, it was a lot, of, a lot of different things, right? And I, I think um, the, I liked, there, there was one paper that I wrote in that, right? It was the first paper that I ever wrote. But part of why I loved it so much was because um, I said, you know, I, I, I heard about this, yeah, I told G protein coupled receptors, right? I heard about this meeting, a receptor meeting that happens once every four years. And I, I, cause I was like, I was just a brand new graduate student, but I was like, I want to go to that meeting. And so, um, so I, uh, I submitted, I, I submitted that four years later, I, I submitted an abstract and, uh, and it was accepted. Right. And in fact, I, I wasn't, they actually gave me a slot where I could give a presentation. And so, um, so I gave a 10 minute minute presentation and, uh, it was, it was just, it was just, you know, different, an analysis of kinetic states of a receptor binding, right. It's, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, that's so in the weeds. Right. But, um, but I got to, I got to present it to, um, uh, Bob Lefkowitz and Brian Kabilka. And so these, these were big names in G protein coupled receptor research. And in fact, they won the Nobel prize several years later. So the fact that I got to like wow. talk about that science with them and, and uh, you know, stupid no, little no, things. No, that, no, that's freaking cool right there. Yeah. Right. That's, 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 yeah. that's, that's, that's a, to me, that's bragging part right there. <laughs> but the cool yeah. thing about it was like, you know, there's stupid things, right? Like they were annoyed that nobody, nobody was on time with their presentations. Right. And I, and I have this, like, I, you know, I, I want people to, to be respected. Right. And one of the things that I thought was most disrespectful is you're given 30 minutes to talk and you talk for an hour and a half, right? Like that's like, that just is like disrespectful of, of the highest order. So like, um, and, and I had that that's very basic young. manner right there. Exactly. Right. Goes up with, I think. So, so I made sure that my presentation was 10 minutes and they acknowledged me for that. Right. And I was like, I was like really pleased with that kind of thing. So, and, and for some reason, like I'm, uh, you know, I, I make sure that I'm on time with stuff. So I like that. We so can... here's one for you. Let's suppose, well, first of all, have you heard this before? If you want to make sure you're unemployed for life, get a PhD. Uh, no, I haven't, but that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it makes sense, right? You yeah. know, um, I, the reason I got a PhD is because I never wanted to leave school. Yeah. Right. I love, I mean, school's a great time, right? You in your little bubble, you enjoy yourself. You're like, yeah. you know, you're kind of isolated, you know, but it was, but it was also just, you know, I got to, I got to learn about physics and I got to, you know, like the different jobs that I had, like I worked at the very large array. Then I also worked at a, a, a lightning lab where we were inside a big Faraday cage and I got to do, you know, uh, I got to monitor thunderstorms with radar and you know then you know and you know I, I took another job where I just worked for the for the provost and you know you know I learned to write right and I loved I loved writing I liked yeah. you know I uh you know I uh, there was a there was my very first published published thing was when I was a graduate student in a I I can't even remember where it was but it was just talking about social constructs right you know and it was just a, a letter that I wrote in and they they printed it, but I loved that aspect, like just the, the, the banter, right? I actually have a blog called science banter, right? Which is just like, just like bouncing yeah. ideas. Like I love talking with people and just bouncing ideas off. And is this such thing as good ideas or bad ideas or ideas? Just an idea. It's just, an idea is just an idea. idea. You know, it's a, I think it's a, a, it's a bad idea. If you throw a million dollars at it, expecting to get $5 million back that like that, and it, that could be a bad idea. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of startups do that. Exactly. Right. But it's not necessarily a bad idea. And chances are, it might've actually been a great idea. It was just really poor implementation. So there's no such, yeah. Thank you for letting me clarify. I just walk through that one with you. Yeah. There's no such thing as a bad idea, right? You know, what you do with the idea, you know, cause like, like the, the whole thing with like the atom, you know, the, the atom bomb, was that a good idea or a bad idea? It was a fascinating idea. Yeah. 
right? Especially yeah. now, I think I think like I, I read this. I, I think recently they they did sort of fusion recently, or so they think like in twenty years that we have cure all the energy, whatever. Yeah. And that doesn't happen if we don't someone back in you know doesn't do that atom bomb back in the day, right? Yeah, you know the the. I was talking to somebody recently, I can't remember who it was, but they said, I think we're going to solve fusion. And I said, yeah, I, I do. Too. Like I have the, the, the experience that fusion is actually going to get, get sorted out. And I, and I do think that um, g- given where theoretical physicists are playing these days and that, you know, there's a lot of our reality. So well, yeah, but uh, we're, we're right on the of, edge. I'm of, some of the scary, like normal person, like, you know, like, oh my goodness, we can't do this, you know, but I mean, yeah. Well, you know, the whole, the whole thing, like, you know, open AI models, right. That th- those aren't going to kill us. Right. And I, and I, I, you know, I don't know enough to know if right. we're actually going to get to an artificial general intelligence. Yeah. Right. You know, but who's, who's to, if, you know, uh, Christoph hey, Koch, hey, one of the things he says is that, that consciousness may be a function of complexity, in which case, you know, the internet may actually be conscious at this yeah. point, but then I mean, who's, who's it going to talk to? If Skynet does come, we can all blame Sam Alt. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm destroy our humanity. <laughs> so but you know so it's a yeah it's a uh that's a fascinating question right so it is so here's a question for you like regardless of your discipline right suppose you have a phd right and just to make it simple suppose you had like none of 100 things 100 truths to get your phd or whatever right yeah let's suppose 10 years later it's proven 80 of those things are false yeah so only 20 things are true you have to go back and get your PhD over again. No, that's what science is. Okay. Science is so once always. You, once you have PhD, you have your PhD. Yeah, because it's because it's a uh, yeah. That's the other thing, right? You know, a lot of people say, you know, I don't care what your bachelor's in, but you know, the fact that you could withstand that hell for four years means that you could work here. Right? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. you know, I don't know, I don't, I don't buy into that. But yeah. um, so basically, you're saying if you can make your life suck for four years, you can work at my sucky company. Yes. Yeah, exactly. If you can, if you can withstand, if you could, if you've got a high tolerance for that kind of pain, you can work for anybody. I would, right? I would, I would tort. So you're saying if I can be drunk every day in your company, I can work there. <laughs> Excellent. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, uh, so the whole thing about getting a PhD is just around the critical thinking, okay. right. You know, the, the, um, a, you know, a lot of how science has moved forward is, is things are proven wrong. They're like, here's an idea. Let's test this idea. Oh, it looks good. This looks good. This looks good. It keeps looking good. Oh no, it's, it's wrong. Right. And so, you know, you could base your entire, especially if you're younger, your entire career on, a, on an idea to have it be, have it be proven false. And that doesn't, that doesn't negate what you did. Like, you know, um, you know, because, because funding um, is based on finding new things, which yeah. is, stupid right you know like there are so many things that aren't reproducible but it doesn't matter that they're not reproducible because nobody goes back and checks or if they do check you know you know what i mean mostly people just get annoyed right but then they then you can't actually get published disproving something right you can only get published by showing something new so there's it's like it's it's another aspect where um the where just the whole just the, the whole, the whole way it works, right. Is, you know, it's looking at the wrong things, right. You know, people trying to get tenure, people trying to get people, you know, trying to get promoted and all that, you know, they can't, there's only certain things that they can look at. Right. You know, I think when people get a Nobel, Nobel prize, often, oftentimes they just go what looks like nuts. Cause they can, they can have any idea that they want and they can chase any idea that they want, which I think is wasted on the old, right. You should, you should have young people with, you know, minds that are like, you know, really agile, right. And, you know, and with, you know, poor risk analysis skills, right. <laughs> like they should be the ones doing really new and, and exciting things, but it's like, they're usually put into a box saying, okay, if you want to, you want to get your PhD, you got to think this way. And if you yeah. want to get, if you want to get a postdoc, you got to, you got to think this way and toe this line boxes and, and, do this right? thing and, 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 you know, and there's so few jobs, if you want to go into academia, right. That it's like, it's painful to get in. So don't step out of line. And, you know, once you finally get tenure, you know, you don't want to lose tenure and you don't want to lose your funding. Cause if you lose your funding, they may actually kick you out anyway, you know, kind of thing. Right. So it's just, there's just a, it's a, a science isn't really a, especially, you know, in this, in this, the way we, the way we run science now, it's not a great place to go into if you're a, an innovative and wild thinker, right. You should, you might as well go, go into the startup world and, and, uh, and, and create, innovate, 
make yeah. things. Yeah. So what's your opinion? Let's suppose you have two people, two group of people, right? One group of people, they're off 50 years and above, right? Yeah. And there's a good mix of people, different challenges, whatever case may be. Basically, the video, so everything you do to run a society, right? Like electricians, trade people. And then you have a group of 10 year olds below who can do the same thing. Which one do you think would be more successful, the 10 year olds or the 50 year olds? To, to, run, to run things? Yeah, to run a society. But what society, like you take what the 50 year olds above, put them in the, like a state of Nebraska, the 10 year old below, put them in the state of the Kansas, right? Which do I think would do better? Yeah. Kansas. Kansas, okay. I do. I really do. Because, you know, they're, um, they're going to try more things and they're not going to, they're, they're less likely to be married to their idea. Okay. Right. Like they don't care. Yeah. Like, Oh shit, that man, that didn't work. Let's not do that one again. Yeah. Let's try something else. Yeah. Right. But as you get older, you start, you know, thinking, thinking more rigidly. You right? stay in your box. Right. Yeah. And you're like, okay, this thing, this thing should have worked. Why didn't it work? Okay. Let's, let's try it, try it again. And let's tweak this little thing as opposed to like, well, that didn't, okay. That, that thing you said with the swing, trying that, let's try that. Let's see if that works. Right. You know, so I, I, I do think, you know, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they kill more people too, though. You know, you know <laughs> like, yeah, 10 year olds should be able to drive. Right. It yeah. depends. You know what I mean? So, but you know, I, so next one, like, so like you have like two people, right? Two kids, but it can be two people, right? I think some people like, they go to like, you know, a swimming pool, right? One person will go to the highest diving board and jump in. Other person, like, you know, tip the toe in. And like, why do some people like be so, cause like, so like, I won't say scared, scared of them, but other people like go all in, right? Well, I, I think a lot of that phenomenon is learned, right? You know, mm -hmm. like there's, uh, you know, I was, uh, I, re I remember being, uh, I was watching this, this little kid and me and me and her mom were watching her and she, she grabbed this balloon and then she kind of tripped and she fell on the balloon like this kind of thing. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. Right. The little airbag right there. But, but the mom was freaked out because when she was little, she'd had a balloon burst on her like that. Right. And so like, there was, there was an, there was an element of not allowing her daughter to have that experience because she'd she'd had a bad experience with that. Right. And so is this related to what I said, what, what you asked? Yeah. It's like there, the, the, some of the things that we learn, we, it's not because we learned ourselves. It's because we were scared into learning them. You know what I mean? So, you know, and there's some, you know, my, 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 uh, philosophy while raising my kids was to, um, to, to give them enough space to find themselves without, without getting themselves killed. Right. Like, so there's aspects of like, okay, you know, you can't play with the knives. Right. But, but give you a lot of space to, yeah. right. And so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways in which my kids got hurt, but it was because they were like, huh, well, I can't fly. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. My kids, obviously they're all grown. I disagree with this, but when I, my, my flock was growing up, like, you know, like if my kid was in like a swing, right. Hey dad, push me. I push my as I can. But basically, I'll fall out and bust the ass, right? <laughs> you know, and then you go in there, wipe them off, get back in the swing, right? Right. Yeah. Well, that that's the thing, right? You know, there's there's a uh, if if kids weren't so ex so um, exposed to what we were afraid of, yeah, right? Like they like they have a fear of going going there, going too high or whatever. Mm -hmm. So so um, you know, who knows why? You know, and then this also gets into you know, maybe it's not their fear. Yeah. Right. You know, there, you know, there's, what was the, uh, there was a, there was a movie that I loved, which, which was about, it was a researcher who studied eyes and, and he found, he found, um, uh, the, all eyes were like different, like different fingerprints. Um, but they were the, they were the, you know, the, the eyes are the windows of the soul. Yeah. And so the idea was that if you had the exact same iris, that soul, that was the same soul born into another body. Right. And so, um, you know, so it's like, it was an interesting idea. Like there are some people who, uh, have irrational fears of something. Right. And so in this, in this movie, like, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying I, I believe this. I'm not saying I don't believe this either. Right. But in this movie, um, how she died, how she, this soul died in one of their lives was in an elevator. Okay. Right. And so when they found this soul again, they were trying to determine is this is this the same is this the same soul 
and they they pretty much determined okay it's not so then they were saying okay it was like this little kid in india right so they were they took the they they, they were just going to let the kid go back and you know be a homeless kid and on the street it turned out to be but they tried to get her to go into an elevator and she wouldn't go in an elevator she was terrified of the elevator right so was that her fear was that from a past life you know what you know yeah that's a good point like it's amazing what, what people like do and don't do like my, my, my son he has never eaten bread in his life never eaten bread or hamburger he's like in his 20s okay never and eaten is, bread or hamburger. is that is that because of you no i okay. love hamburger and bread okay and he's just never eaten it no never eat wow like, okay like never eaten bread or hamburger like, we don't know why just like it was crazy like we you know little kids i would always like go to the store buy go like buy stuff eat buy hamburgers there's a hamburger jason like like, are you kidding me right now? Like, how do you know that he doesn't like this, right? <laughs> so that that's funny, right? Like, yeah. where does that come from, right? So, and I, and I don't know where. Yeah, all I don't of know him likes him, you know, like, you just. I don't know where that stuff comes from. Yeah. You know, uh, all of the things come from. And and a lot of it is, you know, uh, some of it's learned. Maybe some of it's just imprinted. Who knows, right? Yeah. You know, maybe there is, you know, we do we do know that uh, DNA methylation can go can go several generations, right? Yeah. So maybe that is a way to have the generational memory, right? Yeah. Like there may be a biological basis for that, but maybe it's not yours. Maybe it's not your fear. Yeah. And then like my two of my kids, like, you know, I like use like, you know, like you might drink after someone, you have someone, two of my kids, they will only eat or drink after their grandmother. Not me, <laughs> not the mother. <laughs> they only they will only eat or drink after their grandmother. That's that's hilarious. Yeah. That's so, not, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So talk about the um Something called, I think it's called Seattle Science Cafe. Yeah. What is that? So uh, there, there's a one of the one of the. So this is the whole thing where I started off the whole thing about how scientists should be able to speak to the public, right? But part of the part of the reasons that you know some people are afraid to ask questions because they're going to look like an idiot, right? So um, this this international. But some people don't you know help don't need any help looking like an idiot. That's though. right. Exactly. That's true. But. Um, but you know, when you're asking questions, right? This goes back to a good idea or a bad idea. Like, what if you could talk to an expert in the field and be able to ask any question at all, like even a stupid question, right? Um, and so that's the idea around the science cafes, and it's an international movement. And uh, in in Seattle, um, we I was I was like, this is we've got to bring this to Seattle. And I I met up with a woman named Gretchen because I wasn't you know she was all about about creating venues and getting the venues and all that. And so she had that handle. She's this thing that I can't do is like get people to come talk. And I was like, that's, that's what I love to do. Right. Like I love to in, invite people to come talk and, and give these kinds of, give these kinds of talks. So we were founders. We, we founded the uh, science on tap, right. Which is uh, uh, the Seattle science cafe. And uh, you know, and what you do is you, you bring a scientist in and they talk for 20 minutes and then the rest of the time, and you've got a beer, right? Which helps loosen, you know, any inhibitions, right? Exactly. And they, um, so they can ask any question, right? And so, you know, so people would be able to like somebody come in and talk about, you know, physics or, you know, like astrophysics or whatever, right? And then people would be able to ask any kind of question they wanted to. And, uh, and so that's the idea is that you get 20 minutes and then you get, and then you, and then you just ask questions. And is it like once a month, once a yeah. week? Once a month. Yes, once a month. And how do like someone get invited to this? Like, oh, it's it's a oh to talk, you mean? Yeah, or just to, to go in general. Just to go do it. Yeah, you get on their their mailing list. They send okay. you an email, and they said this the one this month is on this, and you get and you go in and hang out and drink beer and listen to somebody talk about something interesting, and then ask all the questions you want. So, nice. so this is like a a, a kind of hard question. I think. Why do you think there's so few females in STEM? Uh, because guys are dicks. Oh, that's true. We can be. I'll admit to that. So, so uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, that was the bourbon talking. Um, I, I mean, I, and there's stats out there that show, like, you know, like, an average school, like 80% of females are interested in STEM in elementary school. Because it's, it drops down to 10% in high school. Yeah, it's because it's, because it's, uh, it's when, when you are told that you can't do something because of something you've got no control over, right? It, like, you know, it's, at some point, you know, the, the, the worst, the worst thing about somebody saying something, you know, how they talk about sticks and stones will break my names will never hurt me. Um, it's, it's not true. I've got a, there's a, there's a, there's a great, there's a great joke or, or moral story. You could say, you know, there's the, the umpires, right. You know, there's a, a reporter who's talking to an umpire and he, he speaks to a, 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 
a, uh, a young, a young, how do you do it? How do you, how do you do this? And he says, Oh, well, I, I just, I just call them the way they are. Yeah. Right. If it's a ball, I call a ball. If it's a strike, I call a strike. And then there's the, there's the, the, the umpire that's been doing this for 10 years. He's like, that's not how it happens. He says, he says, if I see a ball, I call it right. And if I see a strike, right. Like, so he's acknowledging that there's like, he may, it may not be that entirely. And the veteran umpire is like, he says, he's, it's what, it's the way I call it. If I call it a ball, it's a ball. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the thing that happens with, with people, right. You know, so when somebody says you're beautiful, right. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what anybody says, but it's when you look in the mirror and you look at yourself and say, oh yeah, I am beautiful. Yeah. That's, that's the only, that's the only voice that matters, even though, even though we talk about it, like it's what other people say, but it's not, it's because it's, it's what's going on in our own mind. And so if you get told enough that you're stupid yeah. or you don't belong, you eventually use if, and you get, and you have so much evidence piling up that I'm not wanted here. Right. Or that somebody thinks that I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. You start to believe it. Right. And I think that's what happens for girls in science, right. In STEM is that they, uh, they get told enough. Right. You know, I, I, there's so many stories and both men and women, right. You know, one of my, one of my best friends in grad school um, was told that he was an idiot and he, you know, he shouldn't go into math. Right. And he got his physics degree. Right. You know, so, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, imp there's no such thing as a bad idea. Right. When you're, when you're with a young kid, yeah. all of their ideas are great. Right. Even the weird ones, like the spirit, the little cat they see, you know, you know, or you, you know, I see, I see dead people, right. You know, <laughs> my daughter, if she's like, I don't know why you showed us that movie, that movie was terrifying, but I found out years later is because that was her, yeah. right. She didn't know what to do with it either. So like how many times, you know, if you have a little girl, you know, don't play in the mud, right. Or don't do it. How many times you tell kids, like parents tell kids, don't jump the mud puddle, but like them, the mud puddle is like it's better for them, right. They learn this stuff. Not only that, but it's probably good for their, their immune system as well. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> they're healthier all the way around. So let's talk about your own business. Yeah. So first of all, like for your business, how do you figure out your price model? Right. I think so many people, they start a business, they like charge way too less. Right. Yeah. Like how do you make sure like charge the value needed without, you know, like without price guards in your customer? Like how do you come to that balance? Uh, yeah. I, um, it's, it's so funny because there, it, it all depends on how I'm feeling about myself too. Right. You know, um, I, you know, I was working for, uh, I was working for somebody, right. And, and there, and, and I was like, okay, just, just go like, say the, the biggest thing. Right. And I was, and I was like, okay, I'm going to ask for $150 an hour. Right. And, uh, she's like, great. Right. And you know, it's like, and you're like, damn, I said for $300. Exactly, right. And in that damn moment. It. Right. And so, but then there was like, and then I had to deal with that. That's how much I'm worth. Right. You know, th that's how much I'm worth. And the funny thing is, I mean, $150, that's a lot of money. Then again, it's not a lot. It's not a lot of money. Right. Especially like the kind of the kind of expertise that I bring to things now. And to, you know, to be straight about it, I haven't I haven't upped my rates since I did that. Right. Because that was like such a freaking breakthrough. Right. You know, like, you know, um, but then, you know, and I've had and I've had people say, well, I, I'm, I'm willing to pay you $75 an hour. Right. And so, you know, and, you know, and I can take that or not. Right. But there isn't, there is a, and I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of privileged right now in that I can, you know, I don't have to work. Right. Cause I've, cause I've, I've found like, uh, you know, I just, I, I left a salaried position. Right. And then I just took a break. I was like, I don't, I don't want to do anything for a while. And that's when I started like reading up on psychedelics yeah. and like learning about the whole world and experimenting in that, in that realm. And, and then I'm, uh, I also, I sing for a, a threshold choir. So I left, I left the Catholic church and, you know, and then started singing for threshold, which is singing for people on the threshold of life. Right. And so there's that, there's that whole world of how we are about death, right. We're awful about death, right. We don't want to talk about it. Um, uh, things like that. So, you know, they, they, that's one of the things I'm committed to is just transforming how we, how we relate to death. Right. And so like, I want to do some of that and I like riding my bike. And so I volunteer while riding my bike kind of thing. And I realized that how much, how much do I need? 
really like how much do I need? And I've a, a lot of time I've, I've based it based on that, right. You know, I've got a, you know, I, I'm consulting on a grant that's in at the NI, at the NIH. And I, you know, I said 150 an hour, right. But, you know, I'm working on this other project that I love that for just, well, I'll say based on what you need and your value be two different things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, you know, th this other project that I love and, you know, they don't have a whole lot of money. And so I, you know, charge 50 bucks an hour. Cause I think it's, I think it's awesome. I yeah. definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think you have to be at one price. You had to be, like you said, like kind of like a yeah. flexible, right? Yeah. And I, um, you know, and I, I've also found in the past, like where I've chased the money that it never went well, right. It never went well. Yeah. Right. You know, I remember there was this, there was one point where I was like, okay, I could either go for a post postdoctoral position or I could go work for this, this other company. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get more money going for the company. So I went to work for them and it turns out that I was going to be paid way less than I would have been paid as a postdoc. Right. And I, you know, ended up being fired from that company because, you know, it wasn't that great anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. I ended up in neuroscience anyway. Right. But it was, a, uh, yeah. So there's, there's an element of, um, every time I've gone, I've chased the money. It hasn't been it I love to do. Right. And I, and I've, I've found like, I don't, I don't want to work for the weekend. Right. I really do. You know, when I take a job, I really want it to be intellectually stimulating yeah. and, and give me, you know, what I need elsewhere as well. Cause there's, a, you know, there's a lot of the value that I provide doesn't, isn't paid for. Right. Like I, you know, one of the things that I do is I create a really great space. Right. You know, you know, so like people can, people can say all sorts of things to, you know, I can, I can talk to people and give them, you know, what they need, like to empower them, um, you know, and that I've never been paid for that, but I've been doing that for 20, 30 years. So, so talk about this, talk about your process or basically it's like the whole process of journey from becoming, going, going from working somewhere else to deciding to be an entrepreneur, to starting a company, like how does that yeah. whole thing? Um, well, the, the, the first time I, I did it, which was, uh, right after I left. So it was about uh, 2004, uh, I was like, I don't know how to do, I don't like, I don't know how to, I became a freelance science writer. Right. And that was, that was kind of cool. Right. You know? And so I, I did, I did some weird, uh, some weird jobs. And then I eventually, um, went to work as a program manager. So just so that I could get that kind of experience, but, um, and this last time I, you know, I applied for several different jobs just to be, you know, employee someplace and to just continue that, that whole life, like insurance and all that, that kind of stuff. And I, one of the things that I know noticed is that I have insurance, right? Like that whole thing. You know what? So many people are like scared to do something because insurance, right? Exactly. It's a, right. It's a freaking fucking shame. Isn't it? Right. You know? And so, and I was like, like okay, I that's crazy. I'm going to say this bullshit nine to five job making $20 an hour. Instead of like, I know how to do this great thing for making yeah. a millionaire. Right. Insurance. Yeah. It, because of insurance. Right. And so, um, I, I realized that I had that fear. Right. And so then I, now I'm just like, just buying my own insurance. That's fine. I'm just going to buy my own insurance. And once I did that, right. Because I couldn't find the other thing is, is I like, I kept interviewing at places and, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've been in enough places where the environment was toxic and I'm like, I don't. I don't, I, and you can usually tell right off. Like the interview. Well, it's sometimes. So the, there was one place that I worked that it was, it was, it was my dream job. It was amazing. I loved it. And then, then, um, then there was a, like a reorganization and I got moved into a different department and, you know, and I started working for this empire building. She, she, she was horrible. Jackass. Motherfucker. Yeah. So she was horrible. Right. And I, and I was like, I was miserable because that was going to be my last job. Right. I loved working there. And, uh, and then the reason I, the reason I left is, you know, I, I went to, uh, you know, I was mentoring, I was, I was mentoring some kids in science. Right. And, uh, the, there was a, a, a VP of HR who was talking and he, and that's when he said, you know, most managers are awful. They don't know how to manage yeah. and people don't leave a company. They leave a manager. Yeah. And it was in that moment that I realized that I had to leave that company. So I'll push back that I don't think people leave companies with bad managers. People who come to these like tolerate bad managers. Yeah. Right. Well, almost nobody has a great management program. Like, yeah. you know, you no, promote don't. somebody for doing a good job into a management position, but then they don't give them the skills that yeah, they what need. Called, I think it's called the Peter Principle. With the 
yeah. Peter principle, yeah. Or like yeah. You, you promoted outside your expertise. Yeah. And so, um, and, and so, uh, you know, when I was interviewing, I was looking for positions that I, I was mostly looking, okay, like, could I do this job? You know, this job is interesting, right? You know, that's intellectually stimulating all this. And then I, I just went all in, like, tell me about the company. And, and you could, you could tell by how they would talk about things. And, and after, you know, for like, it was interview after interview, I was just like, oh my God, I don't want to work there. Yeah. Right. And so then I was like, well, hell shit, what do I do now? Right. And then, uh, and so then I was like, well, you know, and, and, and in the meantime, I was, I was doing stuff like, you know, I, I started volunteering more for the food bank mm -hmm. and, and then I was singing more and then getting my, getting trained to be a hostess hospice, um, volunteer. And I like all, all this time, you know, my mom lives at home and she's getting older. And then, you know, my, you know, the whole thing about COVID, like yeah. supporting my kids, like coming out of that whole hellscape, right. All of that. Like, there's a lot of other things. And I was like, I really like not working 40 hours a week. Like, what if I, what if I could work 20 hours a week? And I'm like, wow, I don't, I could, yeah, I could easily work 20 hours a week and have all the stuff that I want. Right. Easily, and, yeah. and do, and do the things that are fulfilling. Right. Like go on this spiritual journey. Right. You know, and yeah, one so. thing I tell people when they're in for a job, like, well, first of all, if you're in for a job, you ask questions, right? Yeah. So I tell people, if you're in for a job, you use like a panel of four, three or four people. Ask them what you not like about this company. Oh, yeah. And like, you was, I mean, people, you'd be surprised how honest people are, right? Well, they, t they, and they talk about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. Cause I always ask them, you know, I ask stuff like, uh, what kind of management training you got? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and so there are some that are like, you know, we're really excited about this. We've got this. And I'm like, oh, okay. Right. You know, and, so, but mostly, you know, I, so there's very few companies that I think I would like to work for, mm -hmm. you know, I would like to work for maps, right? Yeah. That's, that's one of the companies oh, yeah. that I would like to work for. Right. <laughs> but um, again, you never know, right? You might be a toxic company, you know, like, right. You never know, right? You never know. Ex it might be like, you know, actually I do, I do lunch club dates. You've ever done those? No, it's lunch club. It's just a networking thing. I, I started doing it when I, when I went remote, um, because I was like at home. Right. And I wanted, you know, I'm an extrovert. And so then I, you know, I'd get to leave once a week and go have coffee with a total stranger and talk yeah. about stuff. Right. Okay. You know, and the algorithm algorithm was pretty good. So I was usually matched up with people who had, who were interesting people. Right. Yeah. And so, and, I, and I've been doing that lately and, uh, there's why there was a reason I was telling you that, but, um, uh, looks updates, meeting people. Yeah. Map was maybe maps is toxic. Oh, uh, uh, you never know until you actually work at a place. Yeah. No, I have no idea why I was why I was saying all that, but I was just talking. Oh, I was just talking. I was talking to somebody, and they said something. It was so true, and I can't remember what it was. So no worries. That's also the bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, um, what is what is like scientific communication? Um, it's uh, it's it's finding a way to communicate a complex subject in such a way that it it becomes relevant to you. Okay. So, um, you know, you know, there, uh, quantum loop gravity, right? Like that's a fascinating topic, right? And, and, uh, it's, uh, Ravelli, what's his name? I think it's Marco Ravelli, Ravelli. He wrote a book that makes that accessible, mm -hmm. right? You know, like I, and I haven't been able to find anybody who writes, who writes about string theory to make it accessible to me. Right. Yet, Um, and, uh, and so being able to, maybe it's using analogy or, or maybe it's talking about why it's relevant, but you have a conversation that has uh, what it is that you want to talk about um, be relevant to you. Right? Like, you know, who cares why, why, why ants have sex or like they, they <laughs> probably don't. Right. But I don't know. Right. But who cares about that? But then why is that interesting to you? Like, why is it relevant to you? And so, um, being able to talk about it. Right. And, you know, and some, you got, sometimes you just gotta, like, you gotta keep working, working at it. Right. Like, oh, that's not relevant at all. Like you don't care, you know, you know, like the, I was fascinated by whether or not a uh, protein gets phosphorylated when it gets activated, right? You know, nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about that, right? But they, but they are interested in, um, you know, why is it that some people are uh, more tolerant to drugs, and why is it that some people become addicted to drugs, yeah. right? Those particular drugs, like that's interesting, right? And that's on the big, you know, and sometimes, 
sometimes you have to abstract it out enough that it's, you know, you're not actually asking the, the exact question that's going to solve that problem, but you're, but you're building a, uh, a network of knowledge or a network of understanding to be able to be able to probe that question, to be able to understand. I think that's it. a great point. Like a lot of people are like, you want to know, like, let me feel the answer. But the biggest thing is like, are you answering, are you asking the right question? Right. Like uh, is the question you're asking what you need to answer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and sometimes it's not <laughs> right, but yeah. you know, but sometimes, and sometimes you have to ask a different question before you can answer that question. And then then you're off on a tangent, right? And so, you know, like we found something interesting here, right? And we just kept going there and we never answered that question. So it, it's like, you know, it, there's something about, you know, following your nose, like mm-hmm. following, following where you get interested, you know? And I think that's kind of why I love science because, you know, you can just start with something like, you know, dirt's interesting, right? Like I like dirt, right? And then you could start. I mean, if you're a farmer, you better be damn interested in dirt. Exactly, right? But then then you can do all sorts of things yeah. like like what can I grow in this dirt, yeah. right? Or the dirt in India is definitely different in North America yeah. versus from this and place, you know, yeah. like this dirt grows this, this dirt grows that, you yeah. know. And this like there's living stuff in this dirt. Mm-hmm. I didn't know so much stuff could live in this dirt, yeah. right? You know, like how far down before things aren't living in the dirt, right? Yeah, you can put like you like you like you dig in your front yard, like just like worms, moles, like right. There's all sorts of stuff, right? And so there's so you know if you just follow, and you can see the tangents, right? You can mm-hmm. follow any of those. So I love I love uh, letting people explore that, right? I I love it when people are curious, right? Let's suppose someone's out there. They could be eight years old, 45 years old, whatever age, right? And they're like, you know what? I, you know, and they have like a, let's say you have a high school diploma, right? Or let me backtrack. You can't have like, hopefully you don't, you maybe have like a diploma eight, right? Yeah. But when you're age right, you're curious, right? You're like, you know what? I want to be a scientist. What advice you have for them? Um, do it. Do it. And and here's the here's the other thing. It's you already they are a scientist. You know, you don't have any credentials. There's a there's a, there's a way to science. Right. But if you are curious enough to say, I want to be a scientist, then you already are. Okay. Right. You, you're science minded, you're curious, go for it. Just, you know, start experimenting. Right. Like there, there are, there are technicalities that you need to know. Right. Like, you know, how to, you need to know how to reproduce an experiment. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, cause, cause otherwise you don't really know for sure what happened. Right. And mostly because of, entropy and all of the initial conditions we don't know what's happened anyway but you can try and control it enough to be able to ask the right the right kind of question to be able to answer the thing that you're looking for but not when you get into complex systems so yeah so it's wow there i go tangent again (laughs) what does it mean to be peer-reviewed um so you write a paper and you have an idea and you think that you've uh come to a conclusion about something and you've done a whole bunch of experiments and so you write it all up so and you you just write up the the pertinent ones and then you take that document and you give it to other scientists to look at and so does it matter the level of the scientists like does it matter the scientists like one year scientist 25 year scientists uh, people would probably say yeah it, that 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 matters um the peer review process is kind of interesting it's a, it's a job that scientists do that they don't get paid for right you know the the public funds. So it's like the good, good of the scientific community. Exactly. It, it really is. You know, and, uh, and so, and, and then sometimes, so the idea is ideally you wouldn't know who the authors are, right? Okay. You would just look at the science and look at the conclusions they came to. And uh, hopefully you would have enough, like there's, there are some people who have enough experience to know, okay, you can't do that experiment and get the right results unless you have the right buffer. It can be any, it can be scientists in the United States, India, China, Russia. Right, okay. right. Well, yeah, but mostly, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah. I, I, I've never been an editor for, uh, but so one of the jobs of an editor is to find people who'd be willing to read other people's papers, and then to comment on them. And then, unfortunately, I'm guessing these papers like no, it's not like, like a one page like a summary. It's like these like like. Oh yeah. Full documents. Ass, yeah. documents. Yeah. Yeah. With all the experiments and sometimes supplementary information and depending on the level of the journal, right. You know, you've got to, so make, it's not a one hour job. No, no. You're yeah. like, you're dedicating some a good amount of time. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of time to look. And then, and then also, so you may be able to see right away that this, this is problematic. Like you shouldn't do, 
you shouldn't do this kind of an experiment to, to get the, the answer here, or you shouldn't have done this kind of statistics to determine if something actually happened. You know, that's when I, when I moved from physics into biology, right. There was a, there was one of my best friends in grad school. He was also a physicist and, uh, and then we moved into biology and, and our, our advisor was talking about, says, so in biology, you know, you've got something like this, you know, so it's like 50, 50% 50 chance that there's something happening and then you change it. Maybe there's a 30%. And I was like, how do you know anything ever happened? Because in physics, it's like, yes or no, it's like 99.9%. .9%, right. And he was like annoyed. Right. Because, because it's like, you know, so it's like, sometimes you have to do because the systems are so noisy, right. You know, you know, ecosystems are crazy noisy, right? You do statistics to see like, is this actually, is this a statistically significant result that we found? And so, um, and so, you know, sometimes the statistics are wrong. Maybe the experiment was fine, or maybe there was something missing in the experiment, or maybe they missed a control, right? Like you should also measure this. You know, that's, that's one of the things that cracks me up about psychedelics, right? Is that, um, you know, and in all drug studies, you have to have a placebo control, right? Which means that they're not getting the drug, but they don't know whether or not they're getting the drug, except that if you're on a, a psychedelic, you almost always know that you got, you got the the drug, right? Yeah. So, you don't get it. You, you probably know too, you know, exactly. Unless, you unless you never had it, I guess. Well, no, it's not, not, well, yeah, maybe, right. They, they're, they talk about, you know, uh, I was, I was talking to somebody about it. He says, no, you have to have a placebo control. And I was like, well, how are you going to do that with a psychedelic? Right. You know, there's, there's this joke, right. Where you've got all these people sitting around on a sectional, right. And they're looking at this, the group in the center, there's, there's like five of them in the center and they're all naked and they're dancing and yeah. they're holding hands. They're like, well, I guess, I guess we know who got the placebo. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, oh, yeah, you know, funny. so, yeah, so there's, you know, it, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's funny too, like I, back there was a, they, when they were doing um, vaccines, right. Doing uh, uh, vaccines. One of the, one of the questions that anti-vaxxers would say is, well, did they control this study? Right. Like the, and, and, uh, and in some of the cases, like you would never for, if you were a parent taking your kids in for vaccines, you would never withhold the vaccine from them because that's that's what we're doing, right? Where you're coming for a vaccine, right? And I guess with with trials, it's different. Like they they actually they but but a lot of the questions that would be asked of of around vaccination is like, well, did you do the controls? Have they been yeah. doing the controls? And you're like, we don't do that, right? Like. Some of those, some of those experiments, you just don't do controls, right? Because it'd be, um, it would be uh, ethically wrong to withhold the drug, withhold the, withhold the treatment, withhold the medication, right? So there is how about like doing experiments on mouses, right? So uh, brain experiments. So like, is there really a difference like your mouse brains, monkey brains, human brains? Are they as the, the brain a brain to a certain extent? Um, well, you know, there was a there was an exercise we did at the Allen Institute, right? Where we actually took a picture of of a neuron, right? And the and the idea was for you to be able to tell is this a is this in a mouse brain or is this in a human brain? Now that we took the scale bars off because there is a difference in size, right? But you know there are the you know there there are enough similarities, right? That you could you know like a liver cell you know sometimes it's hard it's hard to tell where did this come from, right? So is this from a is this from a human or is it from a mouse? Right. So, um, so in that, in that aspect, right. When you get down, if you reduce it all the way down, like, you know, there, and, and, you know, there, there are genetic differences as well. Like for some reason, you know, in, in the phylogenetic tree, you know, that, that this receptor in rats always uses this amino acid versus in humans always uses this one. Right. So there are, there are differences down at that level, but, um, so, so they're depending on at what level you're looking at, um, there, there are definitely are differences and there are things that are incomplete, you know, like we have models for Alzheimer's and mice, but we don't fully understand Alzheimer's in humans. So we've got some of the markers of what we think is Alzheimer's in humans in mice. And we call that an Alzheimer's model. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's, there's a, a lot of ways in which the extrapolation 
we extrapolate, but we don't know for sure if it's an accurate model of what it is that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, so for your own, own company, what actually does your company do? Well, let me backtrack. So for your own company that you have, is that, are, you a, are, you a, are you a consultant or do you have your own company? Or I, I'm a consultant. Yeah. And I've got my own so LLC. Like LLC. Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about like how you, how you started this journey? Yeah. And then like the, where you focus on now, what you see your future plans are. Yeah. So, um, so I worked for a startup a company that was the, the graph database and it's a ex extraordinary platform. And, um, when I started working, when I started working there, it was uh, mostly customized. So based on the clients that we were working with and what they, what they wanted, but what we, what we really wanted was a, a, uh, a product that we could just ship. Right. And then people would use the product and the different features. Um, and, uh, so I worked with, with, I worked with our clients. So depending on, you know, their academics and industry and government. So we worked across, you know, across, across all the, the different kinds of industries, mostly what they had in common is they, they had a comp mapping their ecosystem. Um, and so I did a lot of working with the clientele to understand their problem and to see how we could, we could help them. And then, um, sending that information back to the dev team. Um, the it's a start, it was a startup. And so the runway got really short. And so, um, the, the company downsized to work solely on the project. And I was doing a lot of the consulting stuff. And so, um, the consulting like stuff. Stuff. So I, I still use that platform. Right. And I, and I work with people who have complex problems. So I, I'm, I like, they, they will refer people to me to work with them. So, and I, and I, and I also work with people who just have a complex problem that they're trying to understand or innovate around. Um, so that's, that's how it started. Right. And, uh, and I, I find that I like that. Like, I like being able to work with people who are, and when I say a complex problem, I don't mean like, you know, a compli a complicated problem is going to the moon. Right. But there's like, it's specific. It's like, you can, you can do that. You can do that with just notebooks. Right. And looking at charts. Right. Um, but a complex problem is like, how do we, how do we have people live on the moon? Like, what is that going to take to have it, to have a, a viable colony on the moon? That, that's a complex problem. Right. And, and most of the complexity is going to be in the relationships. Right. And so that's why a graph database. Right. And so it's like, it's being able to, so I like working with somebody to be able to map out their, their ecosystem. And especially in like in business, you know, if you have a couple people working in the business, they'll have an idea of what their system looks like. Right. But they don't know that their, their own personal models are distinct from each other until you put it into, put it into a boundary object, object, like I said earlier, right. A way to be able to look at it and see, oh, okay. I didn't think our, I, I didn't relate to the, our model. Like this thing is connected to this thing. And then, and then it goes on to do this thing. Right. I actually was thinking more from like the production point of view, right? Like they have a different point of view and you can actually have them align their models. So I like working those kinds of complex circumstances um, in those cases to like make it, to visualize it and to make it simpler and to be able to show them things that were hidden beforehand, just to streamline the whole process and make it, make it easier to either innovate or just to use the resources that they have, or just to keep track of shit. So. Who is your perfect customer and how do you find them? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, so the, 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 perfect customer is somebody who is, um, they have a problem, they have a, a situation, they have something that they're working on, and they realize that it's way more complex than they thought. And they're interested in finding a way to understand the problem, right? And to, to um, being willing to, to look at different, different avenues and somebody who understands like the, you know, uh, a lot of people do in databases, right? Rows and columns, like they understand most things don't happen in rows and columns. That just happened to be an easy way for us to like, to be able to map it out, to, to understand it. Um, people understand that we need to go beyond rows and columns to be able to, to map out something that's pretty complex. Also, somebody who is in a position 
you know, there's a, there's, we call them facilitators. So they're, and, and they're not people who keep minutes and meetings, but, but somebody who like sees the big picture and realizes that if this person and this person were talking about the right kind of thing, that would be magic. Right. And so, um, but it's, and, and they're, they're often the people that are overlooked, right? Like they're the ones that like the, the glue that keep the company together. Right. But, um, you know, they're often the, the first people to get fired. And then later when they, when, when they go back and they're like, wow, I guess, I guess that person did do a lot. It didn't look like they were doing a lot here. You know, they just, you know, they talk to a lot of different people and all this kind of stuff they're usually the ones that are, that are not, um, acknowledged or they, you know, it's, so it's the, the person who understands that kind of complexity and being able to get people in the right positions. So those are my perfect cops customers. So funny story if you're like, so I was an army also army. I was facing a career, right? Two ID, right? And so I've been like two or three months, right? This one guy, he was like a PSC at the time, right? And I always walked by his desk. He was like, hit the computer screen, right? But he was like, he would never do nothing. Right? He just looked at the computer screen, right? So one day I, I, talk, I called like with three people below me, like, hey, what's going on with this guy, right? Like, he does nothing, right? We got to get rid of him. And also at the same time, sir, if we get rid of him, we'll all get fired. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Let's get, get this guy from Motors in, right? Right. I had so, no clue what he did, right? Yeah. I know what he's supposed to do, but he's like doing stuff like, oh, he's doing all this stuff, right? I had no idea what he did, right? It's my people told me. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So, it's, I like working with those people that are like the hubs of all of it, you know, who have their hands in a lot of, a lot of different things and understand what's having the thing work. Cause also if they're, if they're in that position and they understand it, right, they, they, they're committed to, they're committed to something. They're committed to moving the needle in some aspect. And I, I love working with people like that. I love working with people who are, um, who are, are committed to making a difference. Like they really do. They really are interested, you know, making money is fine. Right. But you know, it's, it's like the, the least I mean, exciting until they thing. bring in the UBI, you got to make some money, right? <laughs> right. Right. So or hit the lottery. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But, or have you know, a rich but have that, but having that, having that be like, you know, uh, you know, I like doing this thing and it happens to make me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right. Versus, you know, like I'm doing this to make enough money. Right. I'm doing, you know, like that's, you know, I find that that's I mean, the least interesting. Question, people will say, you know, you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, but work 80 hours a week, or do you want to make 50,000 and do with it how you want to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Right. You know, uh, and you know, I, I'm lucky enough that I could ask, you know, I could actually, I could do that. Like, I don't have to make a whole, I, like, I don't, I, I'm not in, I'm not in um, like survival mode. Right. You know, I like that there's an, there's an element, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that I have very few fucks left to give. Right. So <laughs> I'm very spare with the fucks that I have. That's, that's one thing I, look, I wish like most people like learned earlier, especially me, like the earlier you learn not to give a fuck, you know, the exactly. Better, like, Right. Waiting for watching my kids, you know, especially when they were like 18 ish, right? Yeah. You know, oh, all the fucks they yeah. get, man. Oh, what I have dressed, what this, this, that, you right. know, like, and, I, and people think all the time, like, oh, they care what I drive, what I wear. Yeah. Or I can't, no one cares. I can't say that to people. Yeah. Right. So, what do you like about science? What do you, what do you not like about science? Um, I, I'm going to start with what I don't like first, right? And I, and I don't like the, the structures that we have. Right. You know, it'd be, you know, I really liked, I really liked working at the Allen Institute. Right. You know, cause there was this billionaire who, um, who had an interest in the brain and he was going to do something. He was like that nobody had ever done before. And, uh, and he actually, he, he did the same thing as the NIH did. Right. Only what was different is he had, um, all of this computing power. He put all of this, this web app development on top of the data so that you could actually um, uh, query the data itself to understand how the brain was working. I loved what he did with his money. And I was like, it reminded me of back in the, in the, uh, like in the old, old times where the Medici's would like, you know, they would have, a, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the scientists would have a patron. Right. Um, so I, so I don't like the system in which science has to be done these days, like how, how it, um, I think it, it, uh, it stifles creativity and innovation, right? And because there's just not, there's just not, um, and that there's definitely a survival atmosphere, a scarcity atmosphere, like there's not enough money to go around for people to have ideas that aren't going to pan out. 
right? But that's what science is, right? And so, um, and I, the thing I love about it is just, is, is, is a, it's a, it's a, it's a way to understand your world, right? And I, and the more, you know, I was pretty clear when I first started that it was the way to understand your world and it's not, right? I, it's, it's a way, it's a filter that you can understand your world and it's, um, and it's fun, right? You know, there's so many things that you can do with science that are just a blast. Like TikTok was awesome for that, right? Because you can start to see some of the experiments that people are doing that are just awesome. The stuff in TikTok, it doesn't occur, but stuff people do with TikTok is just amazing. I know it's awesome, right? I appreciate those creators. And uh, and I think that that Mark Zuckerberg is is damn right. He wants to get TikTok shut down he needs because- to be yeah, no, he wants to get TikTok shut down because that, you know, it's going to, it's going to ruin Facebook, right? <laughs> Which wouldn't be a bad thing. So. So what do you do to take care of yourself? I walk. I have, um, I have animals around. I have cats and dog and chickens. Um, I meditate. I meditate every day. I, uh, I sing. I, uh, I, I volunteer, you know, I, I deliver groceries for the food bank right. You know, on my bike, right. You know, it's like, so I get to exercise as well as do that. Um, uh, I, I did this thing called the artist's way, uh, right. You know, I'll take myself on a date, right. You know, just to, you know, to, de to decompress. Right. Um, so I, I, uh, I do shamanic journeys, right. I let my imagination go when free and visit other worlds. Right. You know, so I, uh, um, and I do, uh, uh, a lot of the work. So one of the things about, um, doing, doing psychedelics as a, especially as a, as a way to expand your consciousness, right. Is, you know, there are lessons that you learn in there, right. You know, the, the, the first time when I had that, the really disappointing journey, right. And then I felt pity for myself. And then I saw myself just like go hard on that, like, you know, like how hard I was on myself, right? Like that I would even pity myself, right? Like there's a lot of integration work to be done, like the lessons to be learned, right? Like if, if, if it is, if the, if the basic message is love, right. And you don't love yourself, go to work on that, right? Because there's nothing, there's nothing there for you not to love, right? There's like, there's, there's nothing wrong with you. There's, you know, a lot of people have, um, feel like they under they understand themselves better than anybody else. Right. And so they think that they're right when there's, when they're, when they're picking on the thing that's wrong with themselves. So, you know, I, you know, uh, there's a lot of inter integration work that I'm, that I'm doing, right. You know, like the taking, taking apart all of the assumptions that I have in the, uh, in the world. So there's a lot of introspective work on that one. A lot of journaling. I like to write. So I do, I do a lot of the, that work that way, like sorting stuff out like that. So what's something that you do that you want to get better at? Um, blogging. Blogging. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I used to blog just because I fucking loved it. Right. Like, you know, I was, uh, sitting down and they were pulling down a tree from in front of the, the school across the street. And I, I had the thought like, do trees have do trees feel pain? And then I went, I looked it up and I was like, found all this stuff and I wrote it up really quick and I didn't care about, you know, how accurate it was yeah. or anything. I posted it. Right. It was like, it was awesome. Right. And I did a lot of that. And then, and then, um, it's, you know, they're like, I, I started caring about, you know, who was reading and if there were, if people were reading it and then, you know, I had to be like more accurate and then, yeah. you know, and then people would say things like, no, 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 you, you know, you need to be like more rigorous. And I'm like, no, it's just, it's just banter. Right. You know? So, um, I want to go back to being carefree about it. Right. As opposed to, as opposed to yeah. doing it right or doing it. You got three kids, right? I do. And all the, all the, out of the house now, high school days, college days. Uh, there two of them are out of the house. One of them is, is still at home. Okay. So how do you do this? How do you make sure like you didn't influence them? Like how for this, like, how as a parent do you make sure like you don't influence them to like follow your path? Like, like not, not prepare to be us to give them the freedom at the same to do that. And of course it makes any sense. Well, that's yeah. Like there, uh, um, you know, that whole thing that I said about giving them a space, enough space to find themselves without getting themselves killed. 
right? Um, you know, the, you know, my, uh, my kids all shared with me when they started doing drugs, right? You know, um, they shared with me when they started having sex, right? Because there was, we provided a space for them to, to know, no matter, right? You know, um, and so the, they, they do know that, right? And they've told us now that they, they, and they've told us several times that they appreciated how we are. So, but, you know, and I check in and sometimes I get worried, right? You know, they're, you know, the, like I said, COVID would, did some horrible things uh, for mental health, right? And, you know, all of my kids struggled, right? They were, they, they all dealt with a whole bunch of stuff, but they, but they talked to, they talked to us about it, right? And, um, and then, you know, Scott and I work stuff, my husband is Scott, Scott and I work stuff out in front of them, right? You know, so they, so that they, they know that there is a, you know, there's this whole thing, you know, like, you know, my mother-in-law was coming into town and I'm like, do I take my flipping off uterus off, you know, that flag? And I was like, ah, eh, right. I'm just going to leave it. And we'll, we'll, we'll have whatever conversations that come up, but you know, they were, they were around for that. So they, they, they know that, you know, we struggle with stuff and, you know, we, we talk to them about stuff and they think we're way too affectionate, which makes me happy. So, <laughs> so you, you, you consider yourself a socialist, right? Yeah. What does that even mean? Like, what does that mean? What's the definition of that? I, well, I, I mean, for, there is what, a definition. What's, there your, what's is, your definition? Yeah, what's the for me, society definition? for me is like, I, I, I just want people to be taken care of. And I think that socialists care more about people than any other political party. Right. And, you know, they care less about money and more about people. And I think, you know, uh, for those who care more about, about money than they do about people, right. Like if, if for some people, people are a way to get money, right. You know, that's, I, I can definitely see why they don't like socialism because, you know, I, well, right. I'm fine with spending money. That's what, that's, so we created it for is to spend it. You know, we didn't create it to hoard it. It's a fucking conversation, right? So <laughs> spend it. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so do you think socialism like is definitely different countries or socialism and socialism? Well, I think um I think different countries will oh, do I think socialism is socialism. Um the I, people I, always say like, yeah. like social United States will say. Well, I might have failed in Cuba or whatever country, but right. we, we haven't done it here yet. Yeah, which is BS, right? You know, uh, I think, um, I think different com again, it's all interpretation, right? Different companies, com companies, different countries interpret it differently, and so that's, you know, that's what, uh, you know, that's what they they uh, they they see what they're doing as socialist or not socialist. Right. You know, we look at, we look at, you know, our, our, the powers to be, that be here, you know, we like to think that we're not socialist, but, you know, I think the fact Every time that, a bank fail, we're a socialist country. Exactly. Right. At any time, any time one of the big crone, one of the, the, the cronies fails that we yeah. bail them out. But, you know, um, it used to be that, that we, uh, you know, we paid for the roads and we paid for education, you know, um, in New Mexico, actually, they've got, uh, uh, any kid can actually go to, go to school for free. And part of the, why they did that is because they were 49th in education, right? They were worse than the South. Right. And so they started putting money into education, which, which, um, you know, some, some countries are like, well, yeah, of course, like that, that doesn't even, that is, doesn't even figure into their socialist, you know, you know, the, the universal healthcare for some countries Well, like, of course, like healthcare is like, you know, my dad, my dad said this great thing. He said the difference between the, the United States and Canada is that in Canada, owning a gun is a there is a right. Yeah, it's very 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 serious. Yeah. So and a lot of people like say, like, I'll make this up. So like the, the people will complain, like criticize, like I, I, I we'll say Sweden, right? Sweden is a socialist company or whatever, there's no entrepreneurship. But based on all the like KPIs. Sweden is way, way more of an entrepreneurial country than the United States is. Yeah. Even though they're quote unquote socialist. Right. And that's that's because they don't have to worry about the basics. They don't, don't have to worry about healthcare, right? They can they can say, screw it, man. And well, like it's damaging, right? You know, the fact that um when people lost their jobs, they lost their insurance and then they caught COVID and they were fucked. Yeah. 
right? You know, so, you know, the, the countries that don't have to, that are, they're not worried about their healthcare. They can be more innovative than we can. Yeah. I would push back a little bit. So I'm retired from the army, right? If we have like a free, well, free Medicare. Yeah. It's basically still lost medicine. And like, man, you know, you might not, right? Cause like, it takes like one to two months to get an appointment, you know? Now, give me wrong, like I've had a soldier surgery. It's, it's free and all, but man, yeah. just, it took me like a year to get to that point, right? Okay. So um, that's not socialized, right? Like that is, and look at, look at how people want to take that away, right? It is the basic fucking minimum yeah. that, that you deserve, right? It literally is the basic minimum and it's, and it's not enough, yeah. right? You know, the, the fact that they're, and they talk about 22 vets a day committing suicide is yeah. that's low. That it, number, that is, way that is that. it's way higher sure than is. that. Right. But, you know, um, Beto O'Rourke was, was sharing at that, at that veterans conference that I was at, how, um, they, uh, at, they were at the VA and all of these Vietnam vets were, were upset. It was like a town hall or something. They're upset about not being able to get an appointment for their mental well being. Yeah. And the younger vets that had just come back from Afghanistan were like, fuck, if they're, if they can't get what they need, there's no way I'm going to get what yeah. I need. And right. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the kids that came back from that committed suicide the next day. Right. So it's, um, it's not socialized medicine, right? Okay. It's not, it is the bare fucking minimum, yeah. right? You know, I, you know, I have to, we pay, my mom pays extra so that she's got enough insurance that Medicare will cover it. Right. And so, um, you know, in other countries, you know, when other, when other countries complain about their basic medical care, it's ridiculous, right? Cause they're, it's like, you know, the, the, People in the United States pay way more for shitty or healthcare than they yeah. get in other countries. So, so look at the, look at the, and, and, and there's different things, you know, like in, I grew up in London, Ontario, right. You know, it was, they had one heart hospital, right. They had, you know, and, and anybody had heart problems. They all went to that hospital, right. They weren't competing with each other because it wasn't, you know, the, the whole idea of having everything before profit, you know, was, was, you know, it's, it just doesn't work because if everybody has an MRI, then everybody has to pay for their MRI. Right. And then, you know, so, but what if you only have, you know, one or two hospitals that have MRIs, then you can sh send everybody over there. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And does MRI really cost $10,000? Yeah. No, but to pay for the machine, they have to cover it somehow. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you know, if, if the machine was already paid for, right. You know, so, and if you've got four machines in the, in the building, That's true. right. And every hospital has four machines. And so they have to like compete for your, com compete for your dollars so they can pay for their fucking machines. Right? Yeah. And you have the doctors, like, you know, they have this tremendous amount of debt come out of a doctor's school, right? Who say it's $300,000, right? Are they going to go like do a, be a plastic surgeon to help, to really help no one or go, go to a rural hospital, right? Mm -hmm. They got to make the money back, right? Yeah. Right. And which is why, you know, there's, you know, socialist social programs for uh for uh debt forgiveness mm -hmm. right so yeah that that you know and what if what if um going to medical school like you know you got paid four hundred thousand dollars that's a lot of money yeah. right nobody needs you know a lot more than that you'd be surprised though apparently like 25 million dollars is like a you know it's interesting just how skewed my kids are when they hear about the kinds of salaries that people you know i was when my, when I was little, my mom asked me how much money I wanted to make. And I said, I was, I was going to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. And and she laughed, right? Like nobody makes that much money now. Right. Um, but I remember thinking that, right. You know, that, that, that the hundred thousand dollars wasn't that much. Yeah. Right? That, that back to the thing I, I saw AOC like, some show. And of course I'm assuming she knows to talk about, but she said that, uh, 80% of Americans make 60,000 like less. Mm -hmm. And another thing, like there's another so is that because he's female, right? Like trying to get, trying to get a husband, like, like how tall you want your husband to be? I, I only date someone six foot one or tall. Well, you know, only 2% of America, of the population is six foot tall. Yeah. Well, how much you want to make? Oh, 200,000. Only 1% make $200,000 or more, right? <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, most people like five, eight or below and make like $50,000 a year. Right. So it's a, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like the, the what we, we, what we, you know, the, uh, what the ideal, you know, our standards and ideals, man, ideal. that's, 
that's fantasy land. Yeah. And, you know, being able to, being able to uh, take a look at those and take those apart every once in a while is a good, is a good practice. It's a good mental practice to be able to look at your assumptions. It is. Terry, is there anything else I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? No, I, uh, no, we talked about so many things. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. <laughs> so before we get out of here, can you give us any advice on anything you want to talk about? Um, yeah. And I said it earlier, right? Uh, anything that you tell your brain to do, it will do it, right? Anything. So if you want to learn something new and just try it out, try it as an experiment, right? You know, you're going to, you know, give yourself a year to learn something. Right. And then, and if you just keep practicing at it just once a week, like you said, you know, you will be way far beyond what you thought, you know, and anything. And I mean that about anything, practice anything. So, so last question, how do you make sure that you make sure your brain tells you positive things to do versus telling you negative things to do? Um, you, you got to notice, right. I think I say meditate, you know, cause, cause you'll, all of a sudden you'll start to hear things that you'd never heard before. Like I, I heard myself say, somebody asked me something and the thought I had was what you think I'm stupid. And I was like, whoa, like I'd never heard that before, but, but I heard it. And then I was like, do I do that a lot? And then I realized I did it all the time. Like nobody could say shit to me because who I was, was what you think I'm stupid. Right. And in fact, in fact, this last little story, right. Um, you know, I was, I was, uh, writing, a writing my very first grant. Right. And uh, my, my advisor said, write 16 pages and we'll cut it down to three. And I was like, oh, that's dumb. You know, I don't want to write 16 pages. Right. And so finally it's like the, the grants due on Tuesday and I've got like four pages. Right. And I just, I took it to my advisor and I said, this is the, right. He's a 16 page. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. Just tell me what I'm missing. He says, well, I need to see this. And I said, it's in there. And he goes, where? And I said, right here. And he goes, oh, okay. It needs to be there. And I said, okay. And I said, what else? Right. And he's like he says where is it and I, and I and I was okay it's not in there he says but it needs to be in there and I said okay right and we did this for like 30 minutes right just back and forth and then and then I went home and I wrote the there's three there's three sections to it right the first section I turned that in or the second section turned that in the third section and he called me that Sunday right the grants due on Tuesday he calls me on Sunday he goes where did this document come from and I said you told me what to write and he goes he goes, he's had the conversation like I had with you three times in my life. And the other two times, not only did they never come back to the lab, but they never came back to science. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, it's because I already dealt with my conversation that I'm stupid. I don't, I don't think I'm stupid anymore. So everything you said to me, I didn't take it personally, right? I really was asking, what do you want me to write in here? What do you think would, would get me funded? And he told me exactly what, and I, and I wrote exactly what he said. I didn't take any of it personally. And I was in the top 11% and I got funded my first grant. Nice. So. What kind of award do you think this would be? Like, of course, there's some people that have no filters, right? What do they think they just say it? What if no one had a filter, right? Like, like, you know, someone asked you, what do you think of my suit? That shit is ugly as hell, right? Yeah, what if no one, that. what if no one had a filter? Well, um. Like whatever came in mind, so, you just thought and said it. So, but on the other side, what if, what if, um, you know, your, you know, what if, what if sometimes, sometimes people say things, right. We call them crazy. Right. You know, but, but what if you also didn't take things personally? Yeah. Like, what if, what if you were curious when somebody says that, like, you know, that's really stupid. Well, why, why do you think that's stupid? Right. Not taking it personally. Like, oh my God, he thinks I'm stupid. Right. And then like withdrawing or doing whatever it is. But, but what if you could like, why, why is that stupid? Right. Cause if you're really like asking somebody's opinion and they say it's stupid, well, why do you say it's stupid? Right. Cause, or, or maybe this dress is ugly. Maybe it is. Right. You know, like, you know, you. like I shouldn't have worn this dress out in public. Right. And I actually had that thought because I could see the lines and all this, <laughs> but you know why, you know? So, but what if, what if we just didn't take things personally? What if, what if it, there That's wasn't, point. yeah. So, all right. Last time. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? No. Hey, Thank you. Terry, I really, thanks for being I, here. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Um, as a reminder, check out the Cabinet HR fund, crowdfunding campaign at www.refunder slash Cabinet HR. Thanks for your time. And remember to be great every day. Stop all this stuff.